Hello, my name is Diane Wirth, and I'm a member of the faculty at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and I'm also chair of the WHO Malaria Policy Advisory Group, MPAG. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's virtual webinar, Rethinking Malaria in the Context of COVID-19. We are delighted that over 2,500 individuals are joining us today with just over half coming from Africa. We are live streaming today's proceedings in four languages and, and plan to have recordings available so others may join in this global discussion. I am pleased to be joined by numerous colleagues, many of whom have worked with us in this Rethinking Malaria project from around the world for today's events, including our two next speakers, Michelle Williams, Dean of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health will offer welcoming remarks. And Rose Lakey, uh, Emeritus Professor of Immunology and Parasitology at the University of UND in Cameroon will help set the stage uh, for today's discussions. Both Dean Williams and Professor Lakey have distinguished backgrounds in the fields of public health and infectious diseases respectively. And I encourage all of you to review their many accomplishments as academicians, researchers, and teachers on the webinar website. You will also find biographies for all of our speakers online as well. And to save time, we'll only do brief introductions uh, and you can find the rest of the information on the website. And now I will turn over to Dean Williams for welcoming remarks. Thank you, Diane. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And thank you all for taking the time to join in us today. I'm truly pleased to be here, albeit virtually, with you all for the first of two special webinars this month on rethinking malaria in the context of COVID-19. As a university, Harvard has a long-standing commitment to addressing the complex global health challenges. And at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, our faculty, our students, and alumni prioritize engaging and involving themselves in a diverse set of work that brings us all closer together. All of you are here today because of your strong connections to global health development and also because of your strong commitment to ending malaria. Together, we will take part in an important dialogue about how we, we as a global community, can continue to advance efforts to control malaria while also putting new ideas into action and innovative ways into working and into practice. As today's speakers will describe, an important opportunity lies before us. This is the time, this is the place, and all of us are the people ready and able to make the kind of revolutionary change to combat malaria and improve world health for generations to come. This rethinking malaria effort draws upon the strengths of many individuals, organizations, and institutions from across the globe. Together with fellow faculty members from the Harvard Chan School, I would like to just acknowledge and thank our co-sponsors and partnering institutions, the vast majority of which are academic and research institutions located in the global south. I'd like to thank them for their contributions and input throughout this engagement. And these institutions include the Multilateral Initiative on Malaria, the University of Benin in Nigeria, the KEMRI Wellcome Trust in Kenya, Makerere University in Uganda, UCLA's Center for Health Policy Research, the University of Health and Allied Sciences in Ghana, and so many more, which you will find featured in our webinar event page. I would also like to recognize our generous university co-sponsors, Harvard University's Center for African Studies 
and the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. I'd like to thank them for helping us to expand the reach of this webinar. To speak more about how and why this effort came about, I would like to invite Professor Rose Lecky to share more about rethinking malaria. But in the meantime, I wanna thank you again and welcome. Over to you, Professor Rose. Thank you very much, Dean Williams, for that introduction. And then you ending with thanking all those sponsoring this event. Indeed, the engine of our work is the power of collaboration. And it has been evident throughout the rethinking malaria engagement collaboration. So I thank you very much for that introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you all are. I in turn want to welcome you all, welcoming everyone to this very special and important webinar on rethinking malaria. I would like to take a few minutes to briefly remind us why are we here today? In particular, why rethinking malaria was necessary and then touch on how we approached this unique opportunity in time. The urgency of the global pandemic has highlighted the need for the malaria community to rethink its strategy and critically look at the ways we have been doing things. There has been an increasing recognition over the past few years that we are not on track to achieve the ambitious goals set out in the global technical strategy for malaria. Progress has stalled. And for us to greatly reduce malaria burden and move on to elimination, we need a course correction. I'm sure you'll all agree, over the past two decades, malaria has functioned as a single disease program and there have been many successes, some of which we will hear about later in the program from colleagues in Sri Lanka and China. But today, there are still 220 million cases of malaria and 435,000 deaths worldwide. I wish to remind us that this is the same level of human suffering as was the case in 2015. And of course, Africa suffers 90% of this malaria burden. We have on the continent kind of accepted to live with malaria. It should not be so. This rethinking is necessary to assure us that we can eliminate malaria in Africa and the other regions. Yes, we can. The challenges are enormous, of course. The reason this conversation started and it has to continue. COVID-19 has given us the opportunity to rethink our strategy. All of us have seen how COVID-19 has laid bare the limitations and inequities of our global health systems. In particular, the challenge related to governance, service delivery, integration, workforce, etc. COVID-19 also brought about the fastest production of vaccines and diagnostics in history, proving our ability to quickly, through strategizing and R&D, bring new, powerfully effective products and treatments to bear on public health challenges. And this is exactly what's needed to end malaria. Lessons from COVID-19 will help us rethink malaria, our assumptions, our approaches, our strategies, etc., and then help us to decide on the best solutions for the situation. This brings me, though, to an important organizing principle for rethinking malaria. This process was fundamentally rooted in listening 
and learning from those on the front line of malaria control, especially those individuals working in Africa where the majority of the malaria cases and deaths occur. However, many of the findings that we will discuss are relevant for all the malaria endemic regions. We ask the questions, why are we stalling? What are the problems? How do we solve these problems that keep us stalling and not advancing? What are the game changes we need? This global consultation was therefore organized across three working groups, malaria governance, integrated service delivery for malaria, training and capacity building. As you will hear from our speakers later today, there is a lot of interrelatedness of the topics, but each working group set out to offer specific recommendations and we'll be making them widely available in the coming weeks. Today is just the start of a discussion. We must all commit to continuing this Rethinking Malaria conversation, keeping it an ongoing conversation in our communities, with our communities, with colleagues working across sectors and disciplines, and with those in leadership positions. All of us have to continue the discussion. A broad range of voices is greatly valued and needed. So to kick off today's global webinar, I'm very pleased to welcome our next speaker. She is my sister, an esteemed personality, much admired by myself and many others for her leadership in our region. Dr. Machidi Somoeti, the WHO Regional Director for Africa. I'm very pleased to have Dr. Moiti with us today. She's an extraordinary person. I'd like to take a few moments to share a bit about her. She is the first woman to be elected as WHO Regional Director for Africa. She is currently serving her second term as regional director. She has almost 40 years experience as a physician and public health expert, both at the national and international levels. Her leadership journey includes leading the WHO's response to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa during her first term as regional director for Africa, heading the WHO's three by five initiative in Africa at the height of the HIV AIDS epidemic. This effort resulted in a significant increase in access to antiretroviral therapy among people living with HIV. She led the region to achieve the certification of the eradication of the wild polio virus last year, August 25th, 2020. She has been at the forefront of the COVID-19 pandemic in the region, where she and her team are coordinating efforts and working to connect leaders across the continent. This including also frontline malaria workers too, for a coordinated response to the global pandemic. So it is my sincere pleasure to welcome you Dr. Machidi Somoeti. Chidi, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Rose, for that kind introduction. I'd like to greet everybody who's joined this very important conversation. Professor Worth, Professor Williams, of course, my friend and sister, Professor Rose Leke, and uh, all the distinguished partners, experts, colleagues, and friends who are here to talk about this very important theme of how to rethink malaria. Thank you so much for having invited me and my colleagues and having made me a part of this discussion. We are here to share perspectives on the situation in Africa, and I thank Rose for a fabulous introduction and summary of what has been happening to malaria in the region and on the continent. 
And most importantly, we're here to share ideas, insights, and to propose ways forward. I thank and congratulate also Professor Worth for the work that you are doing with your team, breaking down barriers around malaria. The WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros, has also asked that I greet you and that I speak on his behalf. <clears throat> Excuse me, he was invited, but he couldn't come because he's uh, fulfilling another global commitment. I'd like to recognize and appreciate the extraordinary commitment and leadership of our colleagues from the Harvard Defeating Malaria Group who continue to champion the Rethinking Malaria Initiative. And if I may say a special word about Dr. Rose Leke, she is a ball of energy and has kept us inspired and encouraged to continue our work on polio. And I, I thank you very much, Rose, for your work on behalf of African people and for your friendship. My warm thanks also to the members of the Rethink Malaria Working Groups and to their co-chairs. We will very much benefit from your efforts. We must acknowledge that malaria has become overwhelmingly a problem that's having the most severe impacts in Africa. And our region accounts for 94% of the global malaria burden. And every year, as has already been said by Rose, hundreds of millions of people fall ill, hundreds of thousands die, and sadly, due to this preventable and treatable disease. And this is what must always spur us on to further action. Indeed, over the past 18 months, COVID-19 has dominated the world's attention. It certainly made me and many of my senior staff 100% COVID-19 workers. It's on the highest of government agendas, but in Africa, malaria is very, very much more devastating. Every two minutes, a child under five dies of this disease, and the impacts on African families, societies, and economies are also enormous. So I think this moment gives us even more inspiration. It makes us even more important, looking at the impact of COVID-19, the economic impact that will have an impact on health investment, health services, and the continued impact on malaria, that we really engage in this rethinking and we find ways to break through some of the barriers that we've already identified in our work on malaria. I'll also add my voice to say that uh, in the past 20 years, remarkable achievements have been made against malaria averting countless cases and deaths that we have indeed stored over the past five years. The African region did not meet the 2020 targets of reducing malaria cases and deaths by 40% compared to the 2015 baseline. Only a 3% reduction in cases and an 18% reduction in deaths was achieved. And this is and should be a loud wake-up call to all stakeholders, including funders, that different strategies and investments are needed. The causes of this stalled progress point partly to what my colleagues call the medicalization of action on malaria and to the need to balance between delivering commodities, which has been a very important intervention, and attention to strengthening health service delivery systems to reach targeted population groups to working with uh, communities, and very importantly, I'll also add my own voice, to, to learn from and listen to the people that are really working on the front lines, closest to the people, and see every day the gaps and problems that we all collectively need to face. We need to reduce missed opportunities. For instance, one in four pregnant women attending a first antenatal care visit in malaria endemic communities does not receive preventive treatment. One in three children under five with a fever who seeks care at a health facility does not get tested for malaria. And among them, one in five of those who do and who test positive do not receive malaria treatment. This points to the need to better ensure that policies and guidelines translate into practice and services and lives saved. So we need to think about what it is that causes a healthcare worker who has presumably been trained, who presumably has the stock in their pharmacy not to undertake these actions that are so much part of the guidelines and policies that we all work to develop, promote. Clearly, 
some things are not working. Particular attention is needed to address malaria in conflict zones, in humanitarian crisis settings, and in situations resulting in population displacement, so in situations where people are living under the most difficult circumstances, what we do needs to be adapted to those contexts so that those people don't lose out. To solve the current and emerging challenges in malaria control, strategic investments are needed in the development and deployment of new malaria tools and technologies. And funding, including domestic resources, should be increased for local institutions to lead research, along with streamlining processes for the trials of candidate diagnostics, medicines, vaccines, and other biological products. We're excited about the very promising results showing that the RTSS vaccine can prevent 40% of malaria cases, including 30% of severe cases in high transmission endemic parts of Africa. Combining this vaccine with seasonal malaria chemo prevention has also been shown to reduce cases, child hospital admissions with severe malaria, and child deaths from malaria, all by about 70%. We are equally pleased with the investments being made for the development of an mRNA vaccine for malaria with clinical trials potentially starting next year. And African countries and partners should support the development of these and other innovations that can transform malaria control efforts. We know that this will require greater national investments in research, development, and partnerships, and very importantly, the engagement of experts both on the continent and internationally in these efforts. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen innovations, as Rose has already said, around the use of many technologies in order to make sure that uh, tools are developed, tools are rapidly adopted, and tools are deployed in the field in order to have an, an impact. We've seen other interventions as well from which we could learn and build for our work on malaria. For example, the use of drones to deliver malaria medicines and other essential commodities. Drones are also being deployed in Kenya to carry out vector control. So these are some of the tools that can be scaled up across countries to enhance, expand action on malaria and improve the impact of our collective work. The same goes for new strategies and technologies used to deliver key health messaging around COVID-19 to communities. New tools should be integrated into health systems to strengthen prevention and control efforts for malaria and other priority diseases. We've initiated, for example, in the African region, an alliance to counteract misinformation about COVID-19. And we know that people are very connected to each other in different ways, including on social media, in their networks. These are some of the platforms that can be mobilized to help people understand, to get health workers connected to those who can support them and supervise and encourage them, and to expand the scope and coverage of all the interventions that we are promoting. To translate research results and into innovations into enhanced delivery of health services, and massive reductions in the malaria burden. Health system weaknesses need to be addressed to make sure that children and other priority groups benefit from malaria interventions. We talk a lot about improving health systems. We need to break that down and understand what are the most important components on which we need to invest, which we need to have the patients to follow because uh, transforming the way systems work is not something that can work quickly with uh, low hanging fruits. This we have learned over years of talking about and working on improving health systems. When the time arrives to roll out, for example, the vaccines that are being developed, rapid integration into health systems in countries will be important, including through the speeding up of regulatory authorization in countries. We know that in the past, getting new tools that have been developed for public health into systems in our countries can take up to a decade, partly because of the slow pace of the regulatory authorization, about which we've learned a lot in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we already work with the African Vaccine Regulatory Forum, so-called AVAREF, in our region 
and have learned through the COVID-19 pandemic experience how to make sure that we network them even better, we share tools and approaches, and we fast track this authorization, which is so important for getting new tools out into the field. As new malaria tools and technologies are deployed, investments are also needed to fight fake and substandard anti-malarial medicines that are infiltrating markets and health systems in African countries. So it is no use for a child to indeed get diagnosed with malaria only to be treated both in the public health systems or from procurement in a private, private pharmacy with a fake and substandard malaria medicine and join the thousands of people who die of malaria. We know that fake medicines cause not only treatment failures, but they also increase the risk of anti-malarial resistance. So investments are needed to map the presence of drug resistance, to verify the active ingredients of products on the shelf, and to make sure that patients have access to effective treatment. Financing for malaria also deserves attention, both making the best use of available resources and bridging the funding gap in African countries, which currently stands at 41%. It's also important that the financing does not drive the verticalization of malaria. I believe we've come to the end of the time when each donor, international donors mainly, wanted to see exactly where each of their dollar goes and wanted to see the system financed by their money right down to a community health worker in a village. We must help our systems integrate the way that we work on health, particularly at the peripheral level and focus on making sure that each person, a child or a pregnant mother, receives all the care that they need, including all the malaria interventions that they need. Financing also includes doing more to leverage private sector financing and very importantly, to mobilize domestic resources. We recognize that the latter will not be easy in the COVID-19 economic environment. But this pandemic has reaffirmed the massive losses in productivity that diseases cause. And these economic impacts are true too for malaria and unfortunately for our, our region are projected to go, to go into last for quite a few years to come. When it first became apparent in 2018 that our collective gains were at risk of sliding back, as WHO with our partners, we adopted a high burden to high impact approach for the 10 African countries with the largest share of malaria cases and deaths. With this targeted strategy, momentum towards malaria elimination was reignited, but we are yet to see the results of this course correction approach. There are, however, some signs of progress in that eight out of the 10 targeted countries, for instance, now have malaria stratification maps showing how cases, deaths, and access to health services and malaria interventions inter intersect. Tailored responses have been launched based on this data and countries like Uganda are taking mass action as part of a multi-sectoral malaria response. As WHO, we are determined that the 2030 target of reducing the malaria burden by 90% compared to the 2015 baseline be reached. It's clear, however, that to do this, business as usual is not an option. This is why we've started a process of rethinking malaria in Africa also, by taking a step back and reflecting on how interventions to prevent, control, and eliminate malaria can be reimagined. We've embarked on a pragmatic, inclusive, and consultative process to take stock of what works in malaria control programs and what has clearly not worked, as well as contextualizing emerging lessons from the COVID-19 response. In June 2021, we convened a think tank meeting of African thought leaders who shared with us innovative ways of getting back on track towards the 2030 targets. Among others, they recommended multi-sectoral elections, which is not a new idea, and a comprehensive all of society investment approach. Though these are not new ideas, we have to make them actually work in practice. We have to sustain them. We have to see, for example, that the collaboration that's needed with priority sectors like agriculture, roads and construction, mining, and very importantly, the environment, as well as with the private sector to de deploy their resources in support of public health measures for the 
for vector control actually do happen. At the WHO Regional Committee for Africa, which concluded last week, Africa's health ministers voiced strong support for multisectoral approaches for health, and I'm certain we'll be ready to adopt them for malaria in particular. The benefit of such approaches is one of the key lessons that we have learned from the response to COVID-19. The thought leaders also called for a reprioritization of community participation and involvement of local stakeholders, including political actors. Again, hardly new ideas, but this is something that we have to see working for malaria, practically, as we have learned uh, their importance in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, as I said, but also previously in response to Ebola outbreak, very much in response to HIV, for polio, among other health threats. Community engagement and empowerment are enduring principles of primary health care that were divorced from malaria in its verticalization. It's time now to pursue a more integrated approach. This has been done before, for example, bringing together the various single disease programs under the banner of neglected tropical diseases. And at WHO in the region, we've merged our malaria and neglected tropical diseases programs to form a team on tropical and vector-borne diseases since they have key interventions in common. And we believe that if we share the capacities across these teams, we will get more value for our investment in this work. The thought leaders praised the high impact to high burden initiative for strengthening analytics informed malaria stratification mapping and tailoring of interventions in line with the distribution of cases and deaths. So this has the potential to deliver efficiency gains in malaria investing and was recommended for expansion to all malaria endemic countries. Its scope should also be expanded to include GIS technologies to identify left behind communities and make sure that the needed interventions do reach them. We'll soon launch an independent assessment of the implementation of this high impact to high, high burden to high impact country led approach to learn what is working and what is not. We also, in the first quarter of next year, plan to convene a regional meeting of policymakers from health, agriculture, environment, mining and road sectors, as well as participants from the private sector and very importantly, civil society coalitions. They will review the assessment of the high burden to high impact approach and consider the recommendations of our thought leaders, as well as ongoing consultations in countries. And of course, they will also review and be inspired by the outcome of this meeting that's happening today. The regional meeting will be an opportunity to chart the way forward with a framework of action that will inform a new agenda and commitment for malaria in Africa. So in closing, we in the WHO Secretariat are listening. We are primed to take forward the recommendations from this meeting. We are ready to take responsibility for leading the transformation of the malaria response in Africa and to adapt to the changing context and to respond to the needs of our member states and the citizens. Again, thank you so much for taking this initiative, for your leadership, and for having invited me and my colleagues to this meeting. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very, very much, Chidi, for those very powerful and inspiring words. And uh, we've heard you've talked about the progress being made, innovations, problems and challenges. But two things that get me is the plans you have for these high burden countries, high burden, high impact. And also you're emphasizing the importance of integration. Thank you very much. I'll now take everyone over to a session that will focus on insights from Sri Lanka and from China, their experience to eliminate malaria, including all the challenges, the opportunities that were related in adapting, you know, the lessons learned, see how we can use this now for Africa. And for this session, I will have some panelists, a group of panelists. 
But first of all, the first one I, I want to introduce to you is a brother, a colleague, a friend, what else can I say? The director for Global Malaria Program in Geneva, Dr. Pedro Alonso. Pedro, I see you're on and you're muted. So unmute, okay, Pedro. And now, Pedro, I'd like for you to introduce the other two panelists, and then we'll move on with this discussion. Let's hear what they have to tell us, how we can benefit and learn from the lessons that went on in China and Sri Lanka. Pedro, to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Leke, uh, dear Rose. Um, for that uh, brief introduction, and uh, and my task, as you've outlined, is to perhaps uh, make a first set of very quick reflections to then uh, benefit from the wisdom and uh, the experience of our two uh, colleagues on on this panel. On the one hand, uh, Dr. George Gao, the Director General of the China CDC. George, very good to see you also Dean of the Medical School of the University of Chinese Academy of Sciences. And um, uh, for reasons everybody will very soon understand, um, and it's uh, an incredibly reputed and credible voice when one speaks of malaria and malaria elimination, as uh, China is the most recently certified malaria-free country um, in, in the world. So George, welcome and thanks so much. Also, um, uh, Professor Kamini Mendis, um, uh, in her bio, you will see it says, uh, Professor Emeritus, uh, just like you actually, Rose, uh, Professor Emeritus of the University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. Um, she is a veteran and uh, a, a deep thought leader in the field of malaria, also having served at WHO for, for many years. And, uh, and she brings a, a very broad experience, but today um, we will bring uh, some uh, specific questions around elimination and elimination in Sri Lanka. A lot of the more recent push and optimism around malaria elimination came when Sri Lanka, a tropical country with very high transmission, did actually manage to eliminate malaria and be certified malaria free. It's a, a country which just mentioning its name resonates in the history of, of malariology. So thanks so much, Kamini, for also being, being with, with us uh, here today. Uh, Dr. Mueti, our regional director in, uh, for the African region, has reminded us on, on the challenges that we face in malaria, the actions that are being taken. And she has, as, uh, as Professor Worth and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Professor Leke reminded us, uh, we're stalling. We're not making further progress in the global fight against malaria. The number of cases remains uh, stable as by and large does the number of deaths. And this is a problem that we need to deal with. Uh, and, and, and a key uh, conceptual stimulus for this exercise, rethinking malaria. But in this session, we're going to be thinking about the other side of the coin, the recognition that since between the year 2000 and 2019, we have made enormous progress when we speak about elimination. In the year 2000, there were 26 countries that had less than 10,000 cases of malaria every year. Now, that number has grown to 46. About half of the malaria endemic countries in the world have less than 10,000 cases and are therefore within reach of elimination. In the year 2000, we had six countries that had less than 100 cases. And now we have 27 countries with less than 100 cases. They're literally walking the last mile. Our number of our countries in what we've called the E2020 initiative, countries that could reach elimination, um, in, uh, by the year 2020, there's been a staggering 79% reduction in cases of malaria in those, in those 21 countries. And indeed, countries are being certified malaria-free. Just this year, uh, two countries which I particularly love because they represent the two extremes. One is El Salvador, 
a very small country fully surrounded by other endemic countries that one day used to be a high burden country. And they have managed to eliminate malaria and be certified malaria free. Uh, the first country in Central America to achieve that. And on the other side of the spectrum, the largest malaria endemic country, China, that one day had 30 million cases of malaria every year. The same number that the Democratic Republic of Congo has today, our second highest burden country in the world. And China has gone all the way from 30 million cases every year, getting to zero and being certified malaria free. So what better example that there is a road that can be walked down from being a very high burden country to getting to zero. The Democratic Republic of Congo will get to zero one day. So George, I'm going to ask you for some initial reflections on what were the key elements that led China uh, that you believe have been critical for China to get from 30 million to, to zero? Hi, everybody. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, whenever you are. Uh, <laughs> I think this is a very good topic, especially when you put this theme as rethinking malaria in the context of COVID-19. Before talking about the COVID-19, uh, the uh, malaria, I'd like to address a little bit about the COVID-19. Maybe no one believes in China, we have no local transmission of COVID-19, but in fact, it is true. So what we have done, very similar, I'm going to talk about for the malaria. You know, we don't have vaccines, we don't have any very, very effective uh, drugs, but we can keep China such a big country, such a big population, free of COVID-19. Of course, uh, we, ca we calculated in total for the last almost two years after Wuhan outbreak, we already have about a little bit over 30 cases with local transmission. All those 30 outbreaks, sometimes with only one or two cases, some maybe with uh, nearly 1,000 or 1,000 cases, after introducing by the imported cases through the flight or through the uh, you know uh, land border with Russia or Myanmar, Laos, you know the south or north border. Anyway, you general, believe me. So when you are talking about malaria elimination, think about when you want to think about what China has done. Think about what we are doing for the COVID-19 and how we still keep China free from SARS-CoV-2 virus or COVID-19. So that's a very important point I want to make for this same webinar for the rethinking malaria in the context of COVID-19. Now, what we have done, um, Pedro, as you mentioned, um, malaria history in China traced back 3,000 years ago, you know, by the record with some letters in China. Of course, you know, uh, as you mentioned, you know, sometimes uh, you, you, in some state we have uh, 300 million um, cases. But we fortunately, we through our effort, especially, you know, with, uh, I always call this, with a very strong capacity building with, uh, with the so-called community level, community level, uh, basic capacity facility. That's very important. Uh, you know, the community level. If you address the community level for the disease control is important, that are not only for the malaria, but also for COVID-19. So this is where we are, I'm, we, me and my colleague, we are preparing a manuscript trying to explain what we are doing with the COVID-19. Maybe we want to mention something about the malaria. As you know, uh, back to 2017, and uh, in China, we have already no indigenous cases, you know, uh, now for almost four years. So by 2020, all 24 provinces that were previously malaria epidemic have received national recognition. And um, after that, you know, since 2017, elimination work done, of course, as you mentioned, this year, 
June, it was confirmed by the WHO. So, obviously, I wrote something about public, public health, uh, let's say public health, addressing the community level capacity building is the key. So what we have done, first, you need, uh, you know, whatever like, you know, malaria and any infection or any public health emergency event, you need a very strong leadership. So this strong leadership down from the local, community level local government or authority up to the central government. So, you know, with this strong leadership, it's very important, but if you want to have a strong leadership, the leaders, before they make any decision, they need some science-based evidence. So science-based evidence goes first. So this is exactly what we have done for the malaria. You know, we tried, we did something in a so careful way. We tried to divide the, um, you know, areas or regions in China one by one, very, very uh, carefully. And, uh, you know, after that, of course, based on, you know, what we have done and what we have with some even, even some long-term infections, all this, and then we divided, divided all these areas or regions into different kinds of regions with different measures. So they are all based on the science, what we, what we found from the local CDC. Of course, in China, we have a different system. As you know, we have a four level CDC systems. We have the county level, this is the lowest, or community level, and then we have a prefectural level, and then we have provincial level. Of course, then we have a level like where I am director general, it's a national CDC. So for this, um, you know, all this, based on this size, we call it what we have done, one, three, seven. So build it up, build it up, the surveillance system and reporting system. You do the local surveillance in the community level, but once you find anything, immediately you need to report. Of course, especially current, you know, at the current stage, you can always use all this uh, you know, computer-based reporting system. Anything even from a county level, they will immediately report to my level, the national level uh, reporting system. This is the one within one day. 24 hours, whenever, wherever you found anything, this is exactly what we are doing for the COVID-19. If you have any suspected cases, you must report any cases. So early uh, identification or diagnosis, early reporting are the key. So this is the key. So in, the, in terms of the immunization of the malaria, one, the first one means one day. So whatever you are doing, you're going to report. Whenever you find anything, report to our uh, system within one day, 24 hours. And then three, what three means? Three means you must complete your case confirmation and epi epidemiological investigation within three days. So if you suspect you found something, report to, to us within one day, within three days, and we will set our expert from national level, from provincial level, to have a joint force working together to make sure within three days, we have all this done. So this is exactly what we are doing at the moment for the COVID-19. It's very George, efficient. Yeah. George, I'm going to have to interrupt you there because we need to also, uh, and, and I know you, that you could go on and all you're saying is of extraordinary relevance and i've taken note of many of this I, i've taken note actually of everything and I, I retain this element of what you're applying is good public health for covid 19 as you did for malaria and i've retained specifically the elements of capacity building the leadership informed by science and i, I liked what you said the science is ahead of the leadership and, and the surveillance and response system that you were describing right now. Let me stop here and then go to the another country in Asia, a smaller one, a little bit smaller, Sri Lanka, but okay. with, with, similar, with, with some similar challenges. And Kamini, 
your first thoughts as to what made the difference there? Um, uh, hello, hello to everyone. So pleased to, uh, to connect with my colleagues in Africa and, and you all. Uh, so Pedro, I think a lot of things, but I think one of the most important was the action at the local level. I think Sri Lanka focused at the local level very much. And this is in, in fact what Professor Gao was saying. Um, he called it the community. I'm going to call it the, the local level. And you know, in Sri Lanka, it was the district level. Um, there were, I mean, there were 20, there are 25 districts in Sri Lanka, and 22 of them are malarious, were malarious. And in all 22 of them, there were uh, there was a regional malaria officer who was a highly competent person in epidemiology and, and malaria control, who was empowered with a team, a team of people, an entomology team, uh, other people who, who, who was working with them, and they had strong leadership. Uh, they had very good technical um, guidance from the center but they were empowered. So everything in Sri Lanka during this, you know, in the last 20 years happened, the focus was at the local level, at the district level in this case, but, you know, it depends on the country. And, um, and I think this was very, very important because they acted, I mean, we all talk about good data and real-time data, but, you know, it's at the local level that there is good data. And they, they responded on their own at the local level with this kind of technical technical um, leadership at that level. So I, I think that was one of the most important things in, that Sri Lanka did that enabled it to uh, eliminate malaria. And, and let's, let's not forget Sri Lanka was a country, small it may be, but it had a lot of malaria for centuries. I mean, it really was, was high, highly, uh, highly endemic in, in, in that kind of epidemiological setup. And uh, 50 years ago, it nearly achieved elimination, but then we had the hindsight of that experience. It, it, it wasn't quite achieved. But this time around, I think um, there was very strong and good technical leadership at the center, but it was the districts that, that was empowered with very good competent staff, uh, empowered. They had, they had no shortages in, in um, commodities. They had... Uh, they were appreciated. They met from every district. They met once a month physically to review. And there was very good data from the local level, but they could take action on that data. I think that's so rapid response was the most, I think, important thing based on good data. I mean, these are some of the things that Professor Gao reiterated and um, said. But I think it's, it's strange. I mean, both countries seem to have had the same focus. China, you know, two extreme situations. Sri Lanka is a smaller country and China is a huge country, but everything happened at a, 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 the, the, the most peripheral level. Empowering the peripheral level, I think was the most important thing. And then of course it was monitoring and evaluation and at the center and, and that, that uh, so I, I will sort of stop there and ask, uh, I'll have you to uh, maybe discuss No, thanks, thanks Amini, because I think it's it's quite remarkable that in, in just the first uh, opening comments and suggestions from both of you, you both highlighted from two really very different situations, the, the capacity to act and decide at local level and the use of data and a good surveillance system. And, and I cannot avoid but, but, but say what I'm about to say, and, and this is partly the subject of, of of this rethinking malaria and there will be specific comments around this on the governance so it is often said that we still run our malaria venture in a very vertical way um, uh, run from the capitals or outside the countries by and large and uh, and uh, by the financing mechanisms having um, a very strong voice and decision as to what happens in a country or not. And in many ways, what I'm hearing from both of you say is that be this in China or be this in, in Sri Lanka, the capacity at the lower level, at the community level, to have the data, analyze, and be empowered to respond was, um, was a critical uh, element. I will uh, give you a, a minute if, if there's any further reflection on how did the governance in two very different countries like this allow 
for that community leadership, number one. And then the second one, I, I'm going to ask you on, 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 a, on a slightly different thing. I'm perhaps starting with China, a case better known, but uh, I think it's also very true to, for Sri Lanka and all other countries. And that is the reliance on science and the effort to develop new tools and strategies. And of course, China is, no, is known for, for artemisinin, the development of artemisinin and other anti-malarial drugs, not just that. Um, but the role of, of the research and development in those elimination efforts. George? Um, yes, I mean, numerical artemisinin or whatever all this, you know, when you are talking about size, it's not like the discovery of artemisinin, like in the top size. It's not, I call it the you know, land touched stuff. It's so far away from ordinary people. When I'm talking about size, I mean, public understanding of science are also very, very important. So you have the science, if the public didn't understand the science, that doesn't mean you have to have something science-based. You also have to have something manipulable, you're operational, in the, the local, especially in the you know, community level. Um, so uh, this is, I think, it's very important. China, in China, science, we you know, have some top like the, the, national, the, the national unit of CDC, we are doing size, but we have to make sure the size will be the public level. If the ordinary people, they understand. This is not what I will address here. The science-based, lead the strong leadership and that public involvement. Thank you. Brilliant. Kamini. Um, Pedro, so I think, um, in Sri Lanka, I think research, I, I wouldn't say research and development, but research played an enormous role in this, this exercise. And it, it does even today. It's operational research, actually. Excellent operational research. There, there, there is, uh, there was, and there is still a very strong uh, collaboration between the, the program and the researchers in other institutions, the academic institutions and research institutions. Who I think even I mean today even even more than the elimination effort keeping Sri Lanka malaria free, it has now uh, been free for eight years and very successfully so. I think it's the operational research that is really really a very strong component of, of this effort. So um, so I think this is extremely important because with malaria the situation changes. It changes all the time. I mean, as malaria comes down, the challenges are different. It, it, you know, you, you turn from complete coverage of with interventions into a surveillance and response operation. But all these things keep changing on the ground. And unless you have a strong, um, strong input from uh, operational research, I think it will be a, a very challenging task to do this. So I, I would say, yes, it, it played a major, major role and still does. I think I've been very, always very impressed, uh, certainly in China, but in Sri Lanka, but in most other elimination countries, that the, what there is, you may call it um, uh, a science base, a, a, a uh, operational research, implementation research, whatever we want to call it. But effectively, what it means is there was a, a mindset about looking at the problem and adapting the response to the changing problem, as Kamini is saying. So a problem-solving mindset and what I've been very impressed, I've had the possibility to see this in China, not in Sri Lanka, but I'm sure that that was also happening, is that that problem-solving approach was at the basis of the community. It wasn't something imposed from outside. It was actually at, at those bases. Uh, Rose, I know we're going to be coming very soon to the end. And I'm yeah. sorry I've taken too much of the time because you also That's have questions right. that you would like you? to bring to, to George and Kamini. Rose, no, no, uh, you are the one really sitting, you know, over all the malaria, whatever, and all the experience, challenges that you have. It's been so pleasant to hear you talking with Kamini and George. One thing I'd like for us to mention, talking about R&D, uh, Pedro, you know, the role Alan R&D played, especially in China. Let's say something about Professor Tu Yu, about atomicinin and whatever else to get at least you know, the audience to understand the importance of R&D towards this elimination and then you know, tools that are needed. Maybe some places need new tools, others don't and so on. Pedro, I'd like to hear from you and then from any of the two, you know, maybe George will say something. Well, or I, 
I'm, I'm sure George is, uh, is uh, probably tired of speaking about the Artemis and, and he's already said the science base was not just about Artemis or other anti-malarials. Uh, it was about this problem solving approach, this, this mindset that the communities, that they felt empowered to look at their problem and react to them. Uh, but but uh, on your question, Rose, yes, I think it is also very remarkable that the effort that China put on a basic science uh, building out of their traditional medicine um, and, 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 the, and the, the work on antimalarials is best known, but very few people know that China started implementing, following their own uh, experiences, insecticide-treated bed nets in a large scale, 20 years ahead WHO ever recommended them. So it was about the vector control space, it was the treatment space, it was about the large MDA campaigns that they implemented to get rid of the parasite, which is the source of the infection, of course. So a very broad uh, effort. Artemisin is best known, but George, your reflections on what triggered this and, um, and, um, and, and how critical a role did this play in, in getting to zero in China? You know, uh, you already mentioned about artemisinin, also the Chinese herbs. As you know, all those model drugs, they are from either plant or synthetic animal products whatsoever. But they are, you know, for the long history from China, they are all derived from all the Chinese traditional herbs. Uh, you know, artemisinin is one of them. Uh, another factor, you know, for R&D is the control of the vector. You know, how can you get the vector controlled? Although, you know, artemisinin can only be used for the patient, they are the gonorrhea malaria. But how can you, you know, get the vector, the mosquitoes down there? So for that, you know, we have our, our own, um, uh, we have our own um, R&D, very strong R&D basic research for the elimination of vector. So that's that also very, very successful. Um, I think, you know, this is another way you could do all this, uh, uh, disinfecting so all these, you know, kind of chemicals. Some of them they are from the Chinese herbs. Thank you. Thanks, Kamini. If you had and, and and you've had to do this in your past roles, which would be the key elements you would like to suggest to other countries, and particularly thinking of Africa? Where do you go from being a high burden country, like at one point Sri Lanka also was to get to zero? And I know you will, you will probably say, well, it's contextually, uh, you, you have to look at the context, not one country is alike the other. There's always a big risk of generalizations, but surely you also know uh, malaria across the world. You haven't only worked in Sri Lanka, you've worked everywhere. Which would you say are the key elements that can be generalized as critical factors for countries to implement for DRC to get from 30 million to zero? Okay, so I think I mean the That's first an, that, thing... that was an easy question. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you, Pedro. I think the first thing I want I would like to say to uh, to all our colleagues from different countries that eliminating malaria is doable. I mean, I think this is this is something I've learned over the years. You know, countries from uh, as varied as as uh, Sri Lanka being a small country, an island still having a lot of malaria, to China, which is a huge country, but also in many other parts of the world. You know, the the Mekong countries where the problem was intractable. It, you know, the malaria vectors were very very um uh, competent vectors and it, it was a tough situation and they've brought i mean they haven't still eliminated malaria but they brought it down so it's entirely doable now i think uh, you asked me what 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 would be important i mean what would i have to say i mean i think the first thing is commitment i think commitment at every level is so important unless i mean it is entirely doable but if you're not committed I think, you know, it's a half-hearted attempt, you can't do this. It's, it's like a war. I mean, I don't want to make it sound difficult. It's not, it's not that difficult if you're committed and organized. 
So once you're committed to doing it, and that's what Sri Lanka did, and certainly what China and every other country that successfully eliminated did it, and then place, you know, give, give the priority to where it should be, which is at the local level, and empower them at the local level. And as you said, Pedro, I think, I think we have to demystify this research thing. It's the culture of looking at the problem and solving it. And for that, you have to empower people at the local level. You know, there are very good people in all these countries. It's just that we don't, we don't give them enough importance. We try to centralize things too much. Of course, the center has a role to play. They have to provide the overall technical guidance, the strategies and everything. But after that, just look after your people at the ground level. Give them everything they want. Give them the commodities, give them the staff they want, and just you know, just help them, they, they can do it. So I think uh, commitment at the highest government level, from that level, right down through the program manager level, right down to the person at the local level. So this is, this is my, I mean, the, the funding, fortunately in this global climate, we have funding today, thanks to, you know, many efforts, including of course the global fund, which is which is you know hugely responsible for for providing all the commodities and and other funds. So I think that fortunately just now is not a major challenge, and it's up to the countries, a disciplined, committed effort. I would I would say yeah, it's doable. Mm -hmm. That's that's the message I really would would want to give. And for DRC, Pedro, you asked a country like DRC, well. First, we've got to control malaria. I mean, I, I know it's not so, I mean, today we don't call, of, we don't make the distinction between control and elimination very much, but just bring down the burden, bring down that burden using the standard interventions, you know, provide access to treatment, diagnosis and treatment to everyone and provide good coverage with vector control and you're going to reduce that malaria burden and then go into surveillance and, and it, it can be done. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Kamini. And George, it, it's inevitable when one talks of China, that um, a country that has pulled out uh, 600 million out of poverty, the extraordinary economic and social development that has taken place over the last 50 years or 60 years. And I've always been impressed about, in the malaria space, we always talk of multi-sectoriality and all of government, all of society approach. Uh, well, clearly, that's something that China has done. How critical do you think that has been? That it, it has involved other se all sectors of the society, all sectors of government, and, and the role that economic and social development has played in bringing down malaria. Any reflections on that? You are right, Pedro. Uh, like uh, Kamini mentioned, so you need the commitment at all the levels. So that's exactly what China has done or, or what we are doing. You also mentioned about the elimination of the or reduction of the poverty. You know, it's the same thing. For example, at the moment, I'm actually involved in a program in the West area in China for HIV control. It's very similar for the malaria. So you put the poverty reduction, you could have got the HIV um, control, put them together, you know, cover the medical treatment and uh, CDC surveillance and poverty reduction together. Otherwise, with those um, you know, areas with a very, very strong, very um, poor area, you know, because they are so poor, the poverty, if the poverty is still there, uh, you can't do anything. So this is a social development, economical development, and health system development. You must put them together. So this is the exactly need what the committee mentioned commitment from every level to do the coordinated work. I think this is actually what China has been doing. My dear friends, I'm getting messages saying, uh, Pedro, you now need to wrap up uh, because I would like to go on for very long. It's coming in. It's been a huge pleasure. George, uh, uh, an enormous pleasure also uh, to see you and, uh, and share this dialogue with you. Thanks so much. Congratulations to both of you. Congratulations to your countries for, for the success and for uh, sh uh, showing the way uh, to the rest of us. Uh, Rose, back to you. Thank you very much, Pedro. Thank you, Kamini. Thank you, George. That was, I'm sure we've learned a lot 
from the experience in China, the experience of Sri Lanka, and there are those points that you have really brought out. And Pedro, I think you summarized them so well. You talked about, you know, you need leadership informed by science, empowering the districts. I think that really comes to us. Maybe that's something that is not done. The high burden, high impact countries have all this operational research, you know, and uh, problem solving mindset. And, uh, you know, there the, are all those points I think we've taken and we're going to keep that. And it's been very, very inspirational. Thank you very much. And we hope everybody in this high burden countries, high burden, high impact have followed on very, very well. And uh, we'll move on further. It gives us a lot of inspiration. I'll now hand over to Professor Ward. Are you there? And, uh, oh, it's, uh, yes. Minister Specio, sir, are you on? Who's taking over now from, uh, yes. Dr. Specio, sir, I think you are taking over right now. Thank you very, very much. And I hand over to you. Specioso, you need to unmute. Thank you very much, Rose. Um, uh, I've been told that my panelist is on the way, as you can see. Uh, the space is waiting there, but I think while we wait for him because he knows who he is, I could start by introducing him, but also to say how excited I am with the, 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 the deliberations and the fact that we are finally putting our finger on where the abscess is like, most likely to be lanced. I want to introduce my president to you. He has been president since 1986. But what has uh, made him special is the fact that he's a freedom fighter. And uh, in our last session, Kamini said, you have to fight malaria like a war. And what has happened in Uganda is that uh, we were really down in everything. The economy was really bad. We had no health system to talk about. And as somebody who was uh, part of the health system then, I really felt that there is no way one could really bring it up. So President Museveni, as a Pan-Africanist, when he talks, he talks for Africa. He does not only look at the issues of health from a medical lens or only listen to medical people. He takes it as a security matter. He takes health as a wellness issue. And he has raised the health sector in Uganda from where it was in the 80s to ensure that his policies talk to what the people need most. The health system that we have in Uganda still lacks quite a bit because of resources, but we run a decentralized form of government. And the policies talk to having people who need care to get it for free. The public facilities have been expanded to within five kilometers of a village or household. And we believe that as we talk now, what colleagues from China and Sri Lanka have said should be able to put us on the right footing. Apart from that, he puts a lot of emphasis on households, household incomes, household food security, ensuring that there is water. At the last Women's Day, he said, women empowerment is measured by making sure your wife does not become a, a water bowser by carrying water on her head. So we really 
have a president here who talks a lot about what is good for the people. President Museven believes in self-reliance. And I think that what has happened during COVID will really talk to that. As I talk, I'm looking at his chair. I was told by my permanent secretary in the Ministry of Health that the president is coming. And uh, I just hope that he will be here with us. When I actually went to Harvard, because I was uh, to introduce myself, I'm Dr. Speciosa Wandira Kazibwe, a physician who specialized in surgery, then joined politics. And I served from the village local council, to becoming a city councillor, to getting to parliament. So issues of local governance are very dear to me. I was also minister for community development, minister for women and youth, minister for culture, minister of agriculture, minister of, I really served in many ministries, ministry of tourism, trade and industry. So I can tell you when you talk about multi-sectoral collaboration, these are issues which I believe would go a long way in helping us to move forward. When I went to Harvard as a physician who had done medical epidemiology, I always feel there is a lot lacking in the way we handle the health system. And I've said it to colleagues here that we have ministries of diseases, not ministries of health. And I think that uh, social epidemiology, which brings in elements of political commitment, job creation, the economic sector in general, environment, all these have specialists in their own right, and they should be able to help us in ensuring that we move forward. Now, President Museveni, to me, is a social epidemiologist, and this was evidenced by the way he handled HIV AIDS when he came in and found us really struggling. At that time, it was being handled by the Ministry of Health, and he took it away and took it under the presidency and made sure that all ministries with their expertise got involved under the leadership of the, the presidency and himself as the chief mobilizer to ensure that uh, HIV AIDS was contained. I would like to say, has the president come? No. No, he, he hasn't come yet, Rose. This is Diane. Perhaps uh, because yeah. he may have been held up, we should um, move to the next session. And then if he joins us, we'll come back to him. Yes. Very good. I think so. He can oh. find us moving forward. That would be very good. So that is my president, my mentor, my tutor, my teacher of politics. And by the time he sent me to, to, to Harvard School of Public Health under the political economy school, the Professor Michael Reich, I had been introduced to all the, the, the way we thought of multi-sectoral collaboration. President Museveni oh, is with us now. He, he is now here, so he will now join us. Please, Dr. Yes. Dr. Wandira, please continue. You are most welcome. My president, I was introducing you in your absence and telling colleagues here that uh, when Diane and uh, Professor Leke and the president of Harvard decided to invite you, I knew that they were inviting the right president from Africa, among others who have not been able to make it. Thank you for joining us. We know you are busy, but you just came in at the right time. Your Excellency, I had given some introduction already, but I was at the point of saying that uh, you are a social epidemiologist. In other words, you don't only look at the biological sciences, but you look at the whole spectrum of all factors within the country 
which can either exacerbate or improve a situation with respect to health as defined in the holistic manner by the World Health Organization. Your Excellency, this session of ours is called Rethinking Malaria in the Context of COVID-19, and we are to explore what is possible. Your Excellency, you have been a consistent player in the struggle to ensure a secure Africa. COVID-19 and other bioagents like Ebola have unveiled weaknesses in our health systems in Africa. And now we have to condemn, to contend with an invisible enemy, which is biosecurity. As a freedom fighter, Your Excellency, we know that the similar tools can be applied to this. This enemy, or the enemy is called disease, are not easily constrained by sovereignty and national borders. I know that in the beginning, you are to have uh, had your speech, but I'll moderate this by putting questions to you because we are addressing what is possible. We, the malaria community in Africa, we have been led by the Afro region. And the theme for this year is saying zero malaria, draw the line against malaria. And the statistics are very clear. So yet excellency, you have been recognized for many things, but in this context, you have been recognized as the best in mitigating the effects of COVID-19 in Africa and 17th globally. Can you please tell us what it is that you have done to secure this recognition for yourself and in Uganda in this regard? Well, I, uh, I thank Dr. Dr. Wandila Kazubwe for her introduction. As she pointed out, the diseases are not simply biology. The bi biology is, th these are just uh, uh, agents, natural viruses or, or germs. However, they are propelled by human behavior. Therefore, if you understand human behavior well, you will find that you can control these sicknesses more easily. It's not just enough to look at the virus or the bacteria or the protozoa without looking at the behavior of the society. Like this virus, uh, the one of Corona, it just goes only two meters from somebody once somebody has got uh, Corona. It's learned to go beyond two, two meters. So therefore, if you take care not to be within the two meters, even if somebody has got corona, it will not affect you. And all diseases are like that. The, the, many of the diseases are like that. They are, yes, they are agents, biological agents, viruses or germs or protozoa, but they are assisted by human behavior. Uh, if you take, uh, for instance, uh, the, uh, the, the guinea worm, the guinea worm was disturbing us mainly because people were drinking water which was not clean. It the, 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 the agent containing the guinea worm would enter you through ingestion, through swallowing. Now, 
if you cleaned the water, then that was the end of the guinea worm. Or even if you didn't clean the water, but, but filtered out at one time, we were even using the handkerchief to filter out the, the, that uh, container of the, of, the, of the guinea worm. You, 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 you filter it out. Now, the same, same with malaria. Malaria, there are a number of, of areas. We are looking at, uh, for instance, the, the larvae side. Larvae side, killing the larvae of the mosquito. And when you kill the larvae of the mosquito, you will find that you will have less mosquitoes running up and down. If, then you have the treated bed nets. The bed nets that kill the, the mosquito once it sits on, on, on the bed net. Then you have the spray on the walls. The, the, the chemical that you put on the walls and stay there for some month. And if the, the, the mosquito sits there, it dies. But for a long time, we're also talking about the vaccine. I don't know why it became very difficult to develop this vaccine. So therefore, that multi-pronged approach is the way to deal with this malaria, and, and we can deal with it. We can, we can get rid of this mosquito uh, or contain its damage. It must be a, 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 a multi-pronged approach. The use of uh, therapeutics, the use of uh, chemicals is good, but the problem is that the, the, uh, the plasmodia at some stage becomes immune to, to some of these uh, chemicals. We used to have quinine. I don't know what happened to it. Then we had chloroquine. I hear that uh, it, it no longer affects ma malaria. I don't know what we are using now. We are using uh, whatever we are using now. But the question is, why do we preserve this mosquito? Why don't we get rid of it? Or immunize the, 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 the individual so that he becomes immune to the, to, to, to the plasmodium. That, that's my introduction for now. Your Excellency, you are talking about focus on the human behavior, focus on uh, the vector, but also focus on what gives us the real problems when it enters the body. Before you came, Your Excellency, we had examples of two countries which have uh, eradicated malaria. And this is uh, China, which is very big. It used to have over 30 million cases a year. And then we came to Sri Lanka. Both countries had recorded malaria for over 3,000 years. Now, Sri Lanka, actually didn't get rid of the mosquito, but they will have been able to be declared malaria free. The two of them, the two countries have put emphasis on the issue of organization. How do you organize the initiative? And this is where they said is key because the technologies are known and one can actually be in a position to do that. They have said that uh, you can have the center, you can have the region as Africa, you can have the, the ministry at the center with the president, you can have the World Health Organization in Geneva, and you have everybody, but the real focus of intervention should be at the community level. This is where action should be. Your Excellency, in your experience, of uh, combating HIV AIDS and also now COVID-19. What is your take on focus at the, the, the community level with respect to ensuring that the technical people are empowered and making sure they do take decisions and also to make sure that the communities participate effectively in all the measures that can be put in place? Uh, 
community involvement is really decisive. Even before you talk about malaria and other uh, sicknesses, um, I, I, I happen to be very lucky that I'm now going to be 77 years old. And before many of you were born, I was already very active walking up and down here. Now, I remember at one time, we had a big problem of TB, tuberculosis. And just by mainly community action, TB was eliminated from many of the communities. And this was through sensitization. Even by the churches, I remember in the churches, people were preaching against the tuberculosis. Some of the communities were drinking milk from the cow without boiling it. So through the community and through the church uh, uh, summons, people were told don't drink milk without boiling it. Then the, in the, in the, in the system, school systems, we had a, a subject called health science, where they were teaching us how to build houses, to build houses with the partitions and with the ceiling, so that if somebody is coughing in one room, the coughing does not go over to, 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 to the other room. And, and TB, even before the BCG, even before the vaccine, uh, of, of BCG, the one which we, we, which I saw much later. I had never seen that BCG in the 1950s. I never saw it in the 1960s. I never saw it in the 1970s. I only saw it recently in the 1980s. Uh, but even before the BCG vaccine, uh, TB had almost disappeared. And that's, that, that is a testimony to the community action. So therefore, uh, like uh, with, with, with age, it was the same story, behavior change. Because, because uh, AIDS could not get you by simply shaking hands. Uh, AIDS was, was going through a few known ways which we were able to tell our people about. Uh, and uh, prevalence in Uganda went from 30% at one time to, to, to very low levels to uh, around 6% or below. Even with this, with this corona, that community sensitization and behavior change and awareness is very decisive for many of the sicknesses. Your Excellency, we also have the issue of uh, research because China and Sri Lanka have said we need to do research Yes, we can have uh, the basic research related to issues of uh, the biology of the agent that causes malaria and other diseases. But we, the, 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 it was emphasized that operational research, again, where the disease is in the community is very important. Your Excellency, how would you advise your colleagues in ALMA and the whole of Africa, for us to come up with the kind of operational research, given the unique nature of Uganda, it is right in the middle. How do you actually get the other countries to, to hinge on to the kind of operational research to enable us move to eliminate malaria in Africa? Well, in Uganda here, we are emphasizing the research we are supporting uh, our institutions, supporting the Uganda Virus Research Center, supporting the universities. Uh, uh, th th these universities have a lot of, of potential. You remember we, have, we the Africans have been here for the last four and a half million years. So we have got a lot of, uh, of, 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 of knowledge which is in the community, but many of the times is not known to the world. Now, what is happening is that our, our scientists who are from the community, 
when they get education, they bring that, uh, what they know traditionally, they, then they subject it to modern methods of investigation. Uh, and, and, and we get very good re results. That's how we get, uh, we are beginning to get a number of, of solutions. But uh, so the, it is the universities, it is the research institutions that must take, take the lead, should be supported, should be funded. And these scientists should be funded. But then there should also be, be collaboration. Like for instance, uh, we have been looking for some uh, chemicals which we need to make the vaccine. We are developing our own vaccine, uh, but you find that there are some chemicals that are needed. For instance, there is one chemical known as beta propiolactone. That, that, that uh, I, I, I took interest in this. What is this? Where, where, does it, where, where does it come from? We're, we're buying it from somewhere and they tried to dodge us, but we, we, we persisted until we got it. But apart from uh, getting it and uh, giving it to our people to develop our own vaccine and the other chemicals which are needed, uh, we found that after it was from ethanol, ethanol from uh, our, our own products, from cassava, from uh, sugar cane, from, uh, from uh, sugar. Uh, that's what we found later. So now our scientists uh, are not only working on the vaccine, but we are going to get all those chemicals, all those chemicals which are based on, uh, on, uh, on, on starch or any of those products. But it would be good if the African countries collaborated here. Instead of each country trying to like Uganda, for instance, now trying to do the vaccine uh, by multiplying the viruses. We are now very rich in the viruses. We have got a big supply of them, uh, but also struggling with the chemicals. If we had a division of labor and some of the countries produce the, vaccine, the, the, the chemicals for, 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 for inactivating the viruses, Others produce some other some other chemicals. Others co concentrate on the multiplying the viruses. Then would move much faster. So what I would recommend is collaboration. Collaboration. It will make make it much more efficient than everybody trying to 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 be a jack of all trade and uh, uh, w w wasting a lot of time. Your Excellency, that collaboration is indeed very, very important, especially also in the training of our researchers. And here we have uh, very important institutions of learning that have participated in, uh, in, in, in hosting this webinar. And we, would, we, we are asking that uh, apart from only doing the biological, research. You yourself said that behavior is very, very important, human behavior. And uh, I had also briefed them earlier that when you sent me away to study at Harvard, you said, go and do things related to people's behavior because this HIV is taking, is taking people and we don't understand. Your Excellency, when you actually do that, how much how, how much would it take for a head of state to actually draw the line and say, this is what I would like to see happen and to prolate the biological and also behavioral research, given that Africa is so diverse in one way or another, to bring on board our indigenous knowledge and also the anthropological aspects of the way we have developed uh, in different parts of Africa? Well, the change of, of behavior will have to be either by sensitization or in some cases by, 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 by pressure, by force. Like, like in the case of Corona, apart from talking, we had to impose lockdowns. 
we have had, uh, I think, two lockdowns. Uh, so we preached, but also implemented. Otherwise, so many people would have died. In the first lockdown, we lost only 200 people, 200, maybe about, about 300 in one and a half years, about 300 people who died. But when the second uh, uh, wave came, I think we have now gone up to 3,000. Cumulatively, uh, and, and that was because people got so relaxed that uh, it, it had spread very fast until we came in again to have to impose the second lockdown. So within each country, my, my experience is, is is combining the preaching and also, if necessary, the enforcement. It must be the two sides. Sometimes you can just become a preacher, a preacher, you preach, you preach. Uh, like in the case of, uh, of AIDS, it was mainly preaching, preaching, sensitization. But in some cases, you need to enforce, uh, you combine. Now, regarding the rest of Africa, the rest of the continent, uh, you, you can only do what, what the Bible says, you, 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 you let your light so shine before men that they see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. You, you influence by doing. You do, and, and maybe others can learn from you because you cannot enforce it on the rest of, of, of Africa. You do what you think is right, and if it is correct, people will learn from, from you. Your Excellency, I think that uh, we are almost running out of time for this panel. And I would like to ask you to stay on because we have been involved for a year in looking at this question of uh, the question of uh, malaria and rethinking the fact that progress is made, but now we have stagnation with 90, 94% of global malaria cases and deaths in Africa, a whole year under the leadership of Diane and Lekki. So we would like to actually ask you to stay on. Our responses are going to be very short. And I think at the end of it, I would like to ask you one question, Your Excellency. Given, because I have worked with you and I have seen you, you know, when you decide that something has to be done, it gets done. Given your commitment to Africa's transformation, can we have you draw the first line against malaria using all the arsenal that we have? And the fact that Uganda is in the center of Africa, it becomes the, the place where we shall move progressively to, to, to eliminate malaria in the whole of Africa. This will bring in issues of cross-border collaboration, but already that is ongoing. So I would like to ask you, Your Excellency, if you can commit, because uh, Dr. Moeti, our regional director for Afro, was saying, let's say zero malaria in Africa, let's draw the line. And we are lucky that we have you here. Well, it is true that uh, we have been a bit uh, leisurely in our handling of, of malaria because I think we have lived with malaria for, 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 for centuries. We have not been as scared as we were, as we were with corona. Or, or with the, uh, with the Ebola, uh, but you are right that it consumes a lot of uh, resources and uh, does a lot of damage. So now that, because in the case of Uganda, without a very acute health problem like uh, Ebola, like uh, Corona, uh, we, we were diverted with so many other things. Initially, the economy were engaged in a minimum recovery. We are, we are now struggling with the development and transformation. But 
we can actually take it up uh, and I would want to look at the figures. Suppose we eliminated ma malaria uh, and we reduce it to zero. How much would we save? I, I think they can help us to, to that. But, but once we decide that, the, 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 the actions are there. The live side, this one we talked about, after we have it in Entebbe there, in the virus center, we have, we have that at uh, Nkumba University. They, 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 they had both a bacteria and also some, uh, some chemical, which can uh, kill the, the larvae sides of uh, the, the, the larvae of the, of, the, of the mosquito. Uh, and then all the other actions, including the vaccine. I've, no, I've never known why the vaccine is, uh, is, is impossible. Somebody told me that the plasmodium uh, mutates or something like that. Yeah. I've never known why the vaccine, the vaccine can never be developed. But we are ready. I'm ready to 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 to, to launch a full war against my, my, the, the the mosquito and the plasmodium, so that we are free of malaria. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. If you can stay with us for about half an hour, we shall now move into the next session where we are giving results of what we did. Diane, you are leading yeah. us in this. Thank you, Thank very, you very much. much, Your Excellency, for that commitment. Yeah. You can be assured that uh, as your senior advisor on uh, population and health, I'm going to take you up on that together with the, all the other players who are already committed to a malaria-free Uganda and Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you, and your excellency, thank you very much for joining us and for those inspiring comments. And Specioso, let me especially thank you. And um, you gave yourself quite a modest introduction. I will remind everybody that Speciosa um, was uh, vice president of Uganda for seven years. She has uh, extensive political experience. In addition to being a clinician, a physician, and uh, a graduate of the Harvard School of Public Health with a doctoral degree. We are very pleased uh, that she joined us and will, is actually one of the co-chairs of the working group on governance and she'll be reporting on that uh, in this next session. So Speciosa, thank you very much uh, for bringing uh, the, the, the His Excellency and um, uh, really focusing our conversation on how leadership and commitment can really make a difference in this fight. So thank you. So next we're going to move to a discussion of the Rethinking Malaria in the Context of COVID-19 project, um, which uh, Rose Lakey and I have co-led for the past eight months. Um, I'm going to call on Rose to set up the context uh, and then we'll call on uh, one of the co-chairs from each of the working groups to give a short summary of their findings. Um, I will remind everybody that there'll be a more extensive webinar September 28th and 29th to discuss the papers and, uh, and ideas and recommendations of the working groups. But this is to give everyone sort of a high level look at uh, our deliberations. So I'll turn it over to Rose to uh, set the stage, and then we'll go to each of the co-chairs. So Rose, over to you. Thank you very much, Diane. Uh, just it's, you know, just listening to the last speakers and knowing that, you know, the experiences from China, from Sri Lanka, so inspiring. And so we know elimination is possible. And listening to President Museveni telling us of his uh, multi-pronged approach, just having him here with us, this has been so great. And this is why all the rethinking malaria came into place. I'm waiting for the slides uh, that have to be put up. This is how it came up that uh, 
the rethinking malaria strategy was put in place. And as I mentioned earlier, there were three working groups. But first of all, I'd like to talk to you about the goal. Uh, the, uh, can I have the slides? Are they coming up? If not, should I just go on? Yes, they're, they're up, Rose. Can you see them? Me, not yet. Yes. I think the slides Michael, are Michael, are slides coming? The slides are currently up to the stream, and they should be one of the live Zoom windows. You might have to swipe yeah. through. Yeah. It is small. Oh, okay. Hmm. Michael, I don't have slides on my screen. Diane, can you continue talking a little bit? Let sure. Me, uh, uh, would you like me to start a... going through the slides while you adjust to your screen? Um, I can do that yeah. if you'd like. Please go ahead because I don't. Uh, okay. All right. Um, well, we're partners in crime, but uh, so the goal um, <laughs> was to identify novel game changing approaches uh, to the malaria crisis. Oh. Objectives were to propose new strategies for malaria governance and financing at the global, national, and district commu and community levels. To identify opportunities for maximizing impact with existing tools and best practices uh, through strengthened implementation. And then to highlight- I got it. You've got it. Okay, go, take it, Rose. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, you started out with the goal. And what I really wanted to emphasize there was game changing <laughs> approaches. We've been doing things all the time. And I was talking with Pedro today, says what will happen. I said we need game changers. And I think that's from where we started out with this rethinking. What can we do differently? So the objectives then, of course, that we would propose new strategies for Malaria for the governance or financing global, national, district, and community levels to identify opportunities for maximizing impact. We thought that was very, very important with the existing tools that we have because they are not being maximized. And then best practices like we heard from China, from Sri Lanka, and then through strengthened implementation. Then to highlight areas where new technology and operational innovations, like what we're seeing from COVID-19 learnings and beyond, how these can catalyze progress towards malaria eradication and elimination. And then lastly, to identify essential gaps in training and capacity building. We talk about it so much over the years, but really, where are we now with that in terms of quantity, quality, for the control elimination of malaria, Continue. Now it has gone. It's gone again, right? Don't okay. see this. I don't know what's, what they changed the slide and then go ahead. Okay. All right. We'll we'll do a team effort here. So yes. there were I get three. the next one. I don't know what's going on. Okay. You go ahead. Because I right. think in the next one, yes, this is the strategies, and then we get on to the uh so sorry, guys, I'm really having that problem. That's okay, Rose. Um, okay, so, you know, I think the, the as Rose said, uh, we've divided this into three working groups. The Malaria Governance Group um, is uh, was uh, working group number one. Uh, it met for six months uh, weekly, and it discussed issues or, related to the uh, background papers, which we'll come to in a minute, uh, to really uh, identify 
proposed changes, and they've come up with five proposed changes uh, that they would like to see implemented. They got input from key stakeholders. Uh, in malaria, we had a group of a large group of advisory members, uh, outside advisors who helped to contribute to this contribution. Working group two was integrated service delivery for malaria. It met again biweekly uh, for eight months from December of last year until July of this year. They did, they had a slightly different approach. They really focused on key interviews, uh, key informant interviews um, selected among malaria stakeholders, voices from the field in particular, um, and input again from the advisory committee. And then in the next slide, uh, training and capacity building was working group three. They met biweekly um, and conducted uh, primary data collection again through key interviews and then commissioned uh, some background papers uh, on their uh, deliberations. So if I could have the next slide, please. Um, it, this was a very consultative process and, and uh, Rose, uh, I think yeah, you, I got you got it. Okay, Rose, take over. I can do this one. Yes, I'll take you through this. It was very important to know that, like Diane is saying, it was a very really consultative process. And you had the global enga engagement across all the work streams. You can see from academicians to ministries of health, the governments, private sector advisory committee members all over in this consultative process that were engaged over 200 individuals. But what's important is that you can see where the really deep figures are in those high burden countries in the African region. You can see that. So that was really consultative and that is what we'd like to emphasize in this. Dan, you can do the next one. Next slide, please. Okay, this just lists uh, for, for the co-chairs for uh, malaria governance. Uh, it's uh, Specios, Dr. Specioso Wandira and Michael Reich. And then the advisory committee members who I won't read out, you'll find all of this on the website. This is for working group one, governance. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, working group two, uh, Evelyn Anash, Professor Evelyn Anash and Professor Karina Musharad were the co-chairs. And again, a large collection of, of advisory committee members, outside advisory committee members who consulted on this. The next slide is working group three. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, this uh, was uh, had uh, four co-chairs with Far Friday Kunafua leading the effort. Uh, including um, uh, three members of the uh, Science of Eradication uh, educational team, uh, and then our outside advisors. Uh, again, the next slide. Um, we yeah. now have manuscripts. Are you ready, Rose, to take over again? Yes. What, yes. You know, okay. Now, as a result, we have these manuscripts, as you can see, from the working groups. And it said here, provisional titles. We're still working on them. Manuscripts, these are for group one. There are six manuscripts here. And we, you can read them all, a look in the, uh, in the website. And you can have, the next slide shows you the manuscripts for group two. There's one manuscript for group two, integrated service delivery for malaria working group. And then two for group three. And uh, this is ongoing. They hopefully will soon, I think Diane has ways and is really working very hard on this thank Diane, for having all these published. And so, you know, it will be available, as we say, to the public. And that's really where we're beginning this really global consultation and uh, we will hear, is there another slide? I think this is the last slide. Is there another one for, that's the last slide. Yep. Thank you very much. And so we bring it now as a global consultation. And now let's hear from the co-chairs. They are going to be presenting to us now with 
come up with the recommendations I had mentioned earlier from their working groups. Thank you very much. And Diane, thanks for this uh, joint effort. Great, thank you, Rose. And um, it's now my pleasure. And I should say that uh, all the manuscripts are going up on uh, the preprint server uh, in the next few days. Some are already up uh, and the, next, the others will be up soon. And the links to those will be available on the Rethinking Malaria website. So I encourage all of you to have a look at those papers and remind you that we will be discussing the papers in detail in September 28th and 29th. So we're going to move to um, uh, back to uh, Dr. Uh, Windira uh, to report on working group number one's recommendations. Preciosa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane. Uh, our group dealt with issues of governance and uh, we were looking at who has the authority, who makes the decisions, and who is accountable, and how societies or people within a country or community actually uh, respond to all this. Our recommendations when we look at uh, ensuring that we eradicate or eliminate malaria was focused on three areas. And these were, these are change the perception of malaria, change the locus of decision-making, and then changing the visibility and use of malaria data. I do not see my slides, where are they? I'd like me to. The, the slides, I can't see them. What has you happened? You have to pin the window. Well, so go to the window with the slide. You have to first see them before you pin. Oh, yes, I have seen the window. It is right next to my president. Yeah. Thank you very okay. much for coming back, <laughs> Your Excellency. All right. So with respect to perception of the problem, like uh, President Museveni said earlier, that we were not looking, we've had malaria for so many years. So we, we were, we've not been taking it as a big problem. And we said that if we are to make a difference, we have to handle malaria as a societal problem of development not just as a medical problem alone. And this has implications for how we finance it, how we actually get to the communities to implement it. And then we need to address malaria with a multi-sectoral approach for policy and decision-making. Now, this multi-sectoral approach has been mentioned many times. This is not the first time we are talking about it, but it has implications for what we are always talking about, the Abuja commitment of spending so much money on health. Because when you look at how we need to change the way we handle malaria, is to look at each of those institutions or ministries of, of, of government or departments, or even UN agencies or philanthropic organizations, and say, how much are you actually putting into malaria for us to galvanize our efforts and catalyze each other's actions to be able to ensure that we make the targets that we need to put in place. We need to raise the, the visibility, authority, and bureaucratic location of malaria. You go back to my country, Uganda, as we said earlier, President Museven said, take it out of the Ministry of Health. We shall have a commission. And you have a commission dealing with issues of HIV. And some of us have been saying, why don't we make that commission, the AIDS commission, really the model for us addressing every time we get a key problem, we address it the way we have done with HIV. Otherwise, as of now, Many countries in Africa simply have uh, a, a malaria manager under uh, the Ministry of Health in a small unit, and they are the ones moving all over the place to make sure that whatever we agree to do gets done. And then under changing the perception of malaria, we want to encourage communities to innovate 
their own initiatives related to the social determinants of health, and also to raise funding to support malaria elimination. Under the universal health coverage, we've been talking a lot about insurance, but the big issue has been how do you get communities that are not in formal employment to also raise their own small resources to finance what they believe is a big problem. The other change is in the locus of decision-making. And here our group was looking at decolonizing malaria, not only from our proverbial colonialists, but you can get the center, you can get Geneva colonizing Afro. You get Afro colonizing the ministries of health, the ministries of health colonizing the district governments and the districts going right down to the, the, the bottom. And this is where we were saying, you know, in China and Sri Lanka, they said no empower the lowest level so that communities can be able to do their own thing. And here we are saying that uh, malaria eradication should be led by endemic countries in partnership with multiple stakeholders within each country and in malaria communities. And we have also said that uh, we must involve communities fully, fully, so that they, they handle the, the, the issues that affect them and we must hold accountable all leaders for progress on malaria in moving to elimination. Now here is when, when you really look at the impact of malaria, you get it globally reported. Uganda has actually moved in this, uh, in this way. When you get to a community, you get one village next to another one. It's really having big issues with malaria but it's taken on average. And then everybody moves along in business as usual, and we don't focus on where the problems are. Like uh, our colleague from Sri Lanka said, if the burden is high, reduce it, and then move on to ensuring its uh, elimination. So we have also said that uh, we must assure commitment to malaria eradication as a national priority, like I said earlier, we would like to make sure that in each country, when you get into that country, there must be a leader for malaria, a credible person who can be respected by all players, that when they get up to stop and the president can listen to them because they have the knowledge, they have the stature and the esteem of all players for for, for, for the programs to move in the right way. The next slide is about changing the visibility and use of malaria data. When we collect data for malaria, it should be done in a transparent manner with the full participation of communities. And this has been attested to by, by what happened in China and also Sri Lanka. Because the data is collected in many countries, endemic countries, by people whose role is not to collect data. I'm on the ground, I know that, even under my work as a champion for NHIV free generation, I've moved it to many countries in, in Africa. And you find it is the nurse who is giving the injection, who is giving whatever, she's the one to fill in the data. When we have people trained to do that kind of work, who should be working with our centers of excellence so that the communities can be in a position to also understand where they are in real time for them to take timely action in our quest to move towards eradication. And this data should be triangulated with economic and social data to drive political and technical decision-making and to mobilize commitment to malaria eradication at all levels. This is where my president said, you show me what I would gain by making malaria a priority now, then I would use those resources to make sure we move towards eradication. Otherwise you find we report on cases of malaria 
how many people have been uh, tested, how many have been treated, how many have died from malaria, but the environmental data in that area is not reported upon. Whether there is drought, there is no reporting in real time on the effect it has on children there on food production. That is how you can actually galvanize communities to understand the importance of the data they are collecting for them to also use as an accountability tool in their local settings, but also at the global and national levels. We need to recalculate malaria financing to include malaria prevention and treatment costs incurred by all state stakeholders. And this is where we have to know that, uh, you know, we use a lot of traditional medicine in Africa, but you would really look around Africa and say, how many countries have done their national health accounts to really say how much is spent on traditional medicine for malaria or any other cause. So we only look at what is being spent from donors or from loans or from the treasury. And then these days we also have the NGOs and the private sector. We must ensure that malaria financing is holistically captured for us to really know how much is actually going into that venture for us to convince the policymakers that indeed this is what we need to do to, to, to move forward. This also goes to data which captures death from malaria. Many of the women, the maternal deaths in Africa are due to malaria, but they are captured as maternal deaths. And yet many of them are due to anemia. And most of the anemia is related to malaria. So when you say that 1,000 or maybe 300 people died from malaria, but you don't capture the anemia-related maternal deaths or the pneumonia-related deaths of children who are severely anemic, then you are missing the boat. Right. So issues of visibility and use of malaria data, we need to work with the centers of excellence, whom I'm very happy are on this platform, so that we are able to convince these communities that they are indeed part of the effort. And as recommended by China and Sri Lanka on this same forum, we should be able to get them on board and to do the right thing. Thank you. Rose, that is what our groups did say. Change the locus of decision-making, ensure use of data, make sure that communities we turn the table upside down and we use the communities to make sure that in working with them, we are able to get everything we need to be able to eradicate malaria. I want to thank my colleagues, Rose, you let me mention my professor and co-chair, Michael Reich again. I want to also thank our colleagues who wrote the papers, uh, Kelechi, who did the paper on compared comparison with other diseases, Jimmy Opigo, who talked to us, and Anya Guyer, who talked about communication because data should enable us to, to move the communication agenda for malaria. And then Ravindra Elia, who, who was with us on issues of uh, malaria financing. Then Jesse Bam, talked about decolonizing malaria so that that data collection and resources are situated within Africa and within countries. And then our friend, me, Coleman, who really said, we must go local, we must go community, we must empower everybody with respect to where they are. Right. We are Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Specioso. Next, we'll go to working group two, Professor Evelyn Ansa. Thank you, Dan. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all, wherever you find yourself. Working group two focused on integrated service delivery for malaria with a subset of activities on R&D and the private sector. 
and um, um, I have Diane has introduced the coaches already. Now, our specific mandate as a working group was to identify how we can effectively and more equitably deliver services universally and in an integrated manner. And we wanted to look at identifying opportunities for maximizing impact with the existing tools and the best practices that there are through strengthened implementation. And also to highlight areas where new technology and operational innovation can, can catalyze progress towards malaria elimination and eventually eradication. There are several key messages that came up during the process and, and these are in our paper. But for today's webinar, I will be focusing on three key messages. And the first message, key message that I want you to um, take away is that malaria control can help achieve universal health coverage. We know that many countries are grappling with what it will take and what it would mean to move towards universal health coverage. And we argue that by weaving malaria control efforts with other services, malaria can lead the way towards universal health coverage and can do this through service integration. We would all agree that despite years of dialogue and numerous technical documents, integration is yet to gain traction, both at the policy and implementation levels in many set settings. And the reasons for this lack of progress is unclear. Now we argue that integrated service delivery is a win-win situation with two sides of the coin or two perspectives. One is that malaria control is strengthened if integrated with other health services. And the other side is that other services do stand to benefit when malaria services are integrated. So both sides present a win-win situation because as we all know, malaria symptoms are common to many other febrile illnesses, including COVID-19. Therefore, building blocks of integrated service delivery for malaria can easily be leveraged for other health needs. And we encourage a context-driven approach to integration which is informed by and involves local communities. With that, we can together drive out malaria and diseases community by community, district by district, and ultimately from our countries. Our second key message, which we want to talk about today is that we need to generate, make visible, and use locally re relevant, complete, and timely data. You would notice that group one has talked about this data um, before, but it is that important. And therefore it's one of our focuses as well. A robust health information system, which is with locally relevant, timely and complete data that is in user-friendly format is critical for integrated service delivery and is critical for a service that is responsive to the needs of its clients. We argue that this kind of data should be relevant where it's being collected and should be relevant to the people there and available to the affected populations and implementers real time and in a form they can appreciate understand and take action on. COVID-19 actually offers a lesson for the malaria community with regards to the dashboards that we used across the world. When uh, we were monitoring COVID-19, the deaths and everything, everybody could understand and, uh, and make sense of the dashboards that we, we used. And malaria can learn a lesson from this. Furthermore, 
data, this kind of data we are talking about, should not be seen as something to satisfy the needs of others. And we know that in many, at many levels of the health system, and I've worked at all the levels of the health system, people usually will collect data and they send it to the next level. And with that, their job is done. We want to propose a paradigm shift that there must be ownership and use of the data at the level where the data are generated. As such, there's an urgent need for everybody, a shift in mindset of all stakeholders, particularly those who generate the data with regards to what this data is meant for. And ministries of health and national malaria control programs must take advantage of the recent technological advancements that we are all seeing, mobile and other technologies to develop mechanisms that will help us to link data from diverse sources, from community, from private sector, from public sector together. So we get holistic and complete data and across all level of, of the health system in a timely manner making this data available so that it's meaningful to those who must act on it exactly where they are. And we realize from China and from Sri Lanka that those who are at the local level must act and they need evidence to act. The third um, key message that I would, we would want to leave with you is that we need to give greater attention to innovation and problem solving for malaria elimination. We do need new tools. We need new strategies. And we also need to make better use of existing tools and strategies in order to catalyze the progress as we need it and accelerate our move towards malaria elimination. Given the gaps that we have now in infrastructure, in technology platforms and in resources, including skilled scientists. We need to focus on sustainable solutions. And these solutions should embed local capacity development within R&D. You would agree with me that when COVID-19 hit all of us initially, every country had to see to their own internal problems. So if you were found wanting uh, with regards to your local capacity, then you were in deep trouble. And therefore, learning from that, we must embed local capacity development within our R&D. Implementation science is also very important and it's becoming important every day. It can help the local scientists and indeed the implementers at the local level identify strategies that will help them to overcome specific implementation challenges. Those that exist now and those that may come up in future. And this will help them to contribute to increased effectiveness of the interventions that are being um, played out or that are being implemented. And we need to equip both the local scientists and the implementers to do this and to use these implementation science skills. It's become a very critical skill for everybody to have. We argue that research institutes and local leaders in the most affected areas must take the lead in setting the research agenda and prioritizing what is most important to them. And then on their part, stakeholders from high income countries must also support and amplify these local conversations and priorities as allies and partners in the fight. Indeed, very critical allies and partners. So in conclusion, um, I would say that integrating our efforts and integrating our services is the way to go as we forge ahead towards elimination of malaria together with several other diseases that exist now and those that may come up. I would like to end here and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Over to you, Dan. Great. 
Thank you very much, Evelyn, uh, again, for that uh, very insightful summary of, of Working Group 2's efforts. Um, I, we are now going to move on to um, Working Group 3, and I would like to call on Dr. Friday Akanafua uh, to uh, report on their work. Thank you. Dan, Your Excellency, uh, very distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I bring you tidings from Nigeria. Good afternoon. I think that our group was group three that focused on capacity building, capacity building for malaria. And as shown on this slide, where uh, the members have been well outlined, and I think we'll be discussed later on, so I don't need to go into that. The next slide is showing... I'm sorry to interrupt, but my president wants to say bye. Oh, uh, Friday, yeah. excuse me. Uh, I, he had been off the Zoom. It, he would like to say bye. Sorry to interrupt you, but could we do I'm that? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Your Excellency. Is he the, yes. I, I think the, the problem of malaria has been that uh, we were used to just managing ma malaria. And our medical service was biased towards uh, treatment, curative side. The preventive, the preventive measures were not emphasized. And that's why I would like data to show what we would gain if we shifted from uh, curative to preventive. And then the conference here seems to be talking about elimination. Because there are three things. There is curative, prevention, and elimination. So when we are talking about elimination, it means we are talking about either vaccination or vector control so that you, you eliminate the vector or people be change behavior in such a manner that the disease is no longer but I don't think that would apply to malaria. I think the, for malaria, the effective side are uh, vaccination or vector control. So I will wait for the figures and then we can single out because there, there are other sicknesses which we live with, typhoid, <laughs> uh, this other one, uh, what do you call, uh, cholera, once in a while it comes up, uh we, we we manage them but now if we are if we are going to aim at elimination like like china did and uh, sri lanka especially sri lanka sri lanka is a subtropical country so if they did it we need to study how they did it and i will wait for the figures and then we shall move i thank you thank you so much Thank you very much, Your Excellency, and um, thank you, uh, uh, Friday, for your graciousness in allowing him. He had a, another meeting, uh, urgent meeting to go to. So perhaps we can go back to uh, Dr. Akunafuo's first slide and he can just start again. So Friday, I turn it to you. And thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your contributions and your commitment. Great. Friday. Uh, you're muted, Friday. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, our group was group three that focused on uh, capacity building and training with respect to the high body countries, respect to high body, focus on high body countries in Africa. And we asked the overarching question as to what are the essential gaps in training and capacity building needed to continue innovation and to be able to get effective uh, interventions 
for the control of malaria in this region. And we got our information from two major sources. First source was PTA Literature Review, uh, with what is already known and published in the region, and especially by experts and research conducted. And second source was through key informant interviews, which we conducted amongst uh, 12 uh, key informants from different regions, from different countries in Africa. Next slide, please. Next slide. So the first paper, I must say that these papers try to provide uh, some information that would en enable the development of a theory of change. Because if you're thinking that malaria is a endemic in Africa, then we need to know what the problems are with respect to the general problems and with respect to training. So what we did in paper one was to identify challenges. We saw challenges that have been reported either by key informants on the literature with respect to malaria control. And then for to then provide solutions for each of the identified challenges. So in this paper, if we read it fully, we have at least uh, six challenges were identified. And along with several others, but I think the major ones were the six of them. The first one was generally, we talked about the healthcare system. We tend to be weak in many of the high body countries. And then the suggested solution was to strengthen our healthcare system and that we indeed need implementation research, not only to strengthen the healthcare system overall, but to strengthen the approach to malaria prevention and management in these countries. The second challenge which we identified was the high poor quality data from many of these countries, which does not allow for, uh, let me say, policy informed or evidence informed policy making, especially data at the local level. And therefore, the paper recommended that African countries and indeed the region need to invest in data collection, appropriate and accurate data collection and digital storage, and then from time to time use them for decision making. The third challenge with respect to malaria control was that we identified that rather than using multi-sectorial approach, because as uh, the president has said, malaria is involved several factors, not just a health issue. But by contrast, what we've done in the past is that in many African countries, people have looked at malaria from a health perspective, and they tended to ignore some other environmental and other issues. So we are strongly recommending the use of multi-sectoral approach for interventions, which involves the use of multiple addressing concerns in various multiple sectors, including urban planning, environment, and so on and so forth. The details are in the paper. The fourth challenge, which we felt was very important, we argued this, and we all agreed that to date, most funding for malaria comes from donor sources. And I think we provided the statistics in the papers to show that there is very limited domestic funding for malaria from all of the African regions, and that there is very limited budgeting, annual budgeting for malaria. Despite the fact that the Abuja Declaration provides for 50% of head of uh, the budget to head. <coughs> This has not happened in many African countries. And so we need to do some work, a lot of work, advocacy, contacts with high policymakers, for them to increase local investment on health and also particularly on the prevention and management of, of malaria. The sixth, fifth challenge we noted, which I think is very important, was the emergence of drug and insecticide resistance. Again, due to poor uh, practices related to malaria, malaria treatment in Africa, because if we don't treat malaria with the right drugs over time, the mosquito and the parasites will develop resistance. So we are recommending the use of a one head approach that encompasses the use of the appropriate drugs in a way that they can be used. Because interventions to prevent and treat malaria are well known. But the fortrightness and the propensity and the synergy to use those interventions have been limited in Africa. So we are recommending multidisciplinarity in the approach to malaria prevention and management. And then that last, the paper one, the last of the challenges that we identify limited technical support, which actually talked about limited uh, technical experts in all the fees 
be it entomology, be it frontline workers, be it health providers. There's a lot of brain drain right now going on in the Africa region because of economic circumstances. And as long as this continues to happen, it's unlikely that African countries will have the right quality and quantity of health providers to be able to deal with the malaria problem. So the suggested solution is that we must focus on wet training and providing of providing incentives to make sure that to enable these health workers to work in all areas of the country, including community areas, villages, and uh, ethnic local, um, and other sectors where this malaria is very endemic. Next slide, please. The second paper focused on identifying challenges in capacity building and training. And again, we relied on evidence from published studies in the literature, from Bill Green and published studies, as well as interactions and uh, uh, the interviews we conducted, the key formats in many of the countries that we just talked about today, Ethiopia, DRC, Nigeria, and so on and so forth. And here we identified uh, with again another six challenges. Again, this is just a summary of what we found, but there are so many others. The first was inadequacy and of training and recruitment of health providers. And here we agree that we should really work out a new training program, recruitment models, staff modification, desensitization, so that they remain in Africa where the problem is, rather than being uh, brain drained to other parts of the world. The second uh, challenge in training capacity building was weak multisectoral collaboration and cooperation, so that you find that for every single disease body, in Africa, you find different training programs going on for them. Again, this is difficult, it's expensive, it's not cost effective. So we are uh, recommending that training and capacity building should be based on using multi secular training of implementers so that implementers can be trained to, multi to actually implement multiple disease interventions rather than just focusing on just malaria alone. And then thirdly, with positioning of universal health coverage. We believe that this is a doctrine that has been very well taken up in many parts of the world and Africa has been focused upon. But to date, primary health care, which is the ankle leg of universal health coverage, is very weak in many African countries. And in fact, the primary health care can do a lot in so many ways, including involving communities, engaging them, and providing education for medical control. But to date, several published studies have shown that uh, primary health care has not been very effective for malaria control in many African countries. And then the fifth one is limited community engagement. I think that today and throughout the discussions we had in group five, we feature repeatedly that we really need to really improve on community engagement, community participation, community involvement. And we actually came to the conclusion that if we are appropriately engaged, community can actually own their own interventions and drive those interventions. And that will increase not only the effectiveness of those interventions, but can actually drive their sustainability over time. And we are recommending that this should be done, including maintaining community health workers into former healthcare systems. And then the last recommendation, which is very important, was issues of gender. The fact that women today constitute a higher proportion of health workers, drive from frontline health workers, but they are not very well appreciated and not well uh, remunerated. And therefore, uh, we are recommending very strongly that we should focus on the training of women, as well as not only from frontline work, but also for them to provide leadership with respect to healthcare interventions in malaria control and prevention. Next slide. I think overall, there are two key messages, very strong. And in investing, the first is that uh, we need, in order to be able to tackle malaria and eliminate malaria from the African continent, we need to invest in the health workforce. We need to improve them. We need to empower them through readiness, through training, continuous training and retraining, because new interventions are being published every day. And so they need to know what these interventions are and how to deliver them. And then to educate them on how to engage on these issues, including ensuring that we pay them accurately and well, especially those who work in communities. And then finally, we also strongly believe that data is very badly needed. They are needed at all levels for those leading and implementing malaria activities. And we need multidisciplinary knowledge and competencies to be able to use the data to make the best decisions, especially at the policy level. We need data 
to drive the policy making and decision making that government take in the African region. So I think that was the recommendation from two papers that the working group three work upon. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Friday, again, uh, for that comprehensive review of, of the very important issue of workforce training and capacity. And thank you very much for your work and the work uh, of your colleagues in the working group. I'm going to call on Professor Marsha Castro, who is also part of that working group and is a faculty colleague of mine at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, to just make a couple of comments, and then we're going to move to the discussants. We have invited discussants from our advisory committee and paper writing community uh, just to reflect on these uh, recommendations and deliberations of the working group. So first, Marsha, and then I'll have we'll go to our three discussants. Thanks, Diane. Um, I think there are a few things that are important to highlight here, um, and, and it's absolutely beautiful to see how everything comes together, what we've been discussing since early morning comes together with the discussion of the working groups. So uh, one important thing that was mentioned before is that science comes first, but above all, you have to make the public to understand science, otherwise that's not going to facilitate if things on the ground. We are having this discussion in the context of COVID, and I think COVID taught us uh, in a hard way what happens we, when we don't recognize science, and even worse, when we deny science. So that's the, the very first important message. Connected to that is the importance of data. Recognizing science demands the need of data. And, and here, I think it's important that we remember what Dr. Margaret Chen used to say, what gets measured gets done. But we need to measure at the local level, which I think it's the other important thing we discussed in here, not just to measure at the local level, understand the needs at the local level by listening to people that are facing the problem in the first place, but also engaging them into the response. That provides empowerment, that provides ownership, and that allows us to really do the rethinking and do things in the right way by involving the, the community. And I think the third important thing uh, is things have to be done in collaboration, but have to be done together. If you just focus on malaria and you don't look at the other disease and you don't think about poverty, it's gonna come back because uh, we know that we have the underlying social determinants of health, which highlights that we need to bring the social sciences into the response. That's another thing COVID taught us. We're not gonna fix COVID if we don't bring the social science and understanding the drivers and therefore the best solutions. So I think that there are many lessons here, but the importance of science, the importance of measuring and therefore the data, but the importance of involving the community and involving the community, it's not just a win-win, it's win-win-win-win because you empower, um, you give ownership and you allow, you really open the room to do the right thing in a way that the governments win, the people win, and the neighbors win because that's going to be benefit everybody. So this is a phenomenal rethinking, putting us on the right track. Great. Well, thank you very much, Marcia, for those uh, inspiring comments. Great. So now we're going to turn uh, to, we have three discussants who each have uh, a few minutes to give us their reflections. I'm going to start um, with um, Dr. Leonardo Simao, who's executive director of Fundusao Yakum Shisamo, but he has, all of you know him, he needs little introduction. He has a long experience in public health, including serving as minister. So Leonardo, are you on? Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane. Uh, let me start by thanking President Museven for taking time to be with us and to share with us his, his uh, vision and long experience on dealing successfully with the great uh, public health challenges. Thank you very much, sir, for being with us. And uh, I hope uh, our sister, Dr. Speciosa, will transmit our thanks to him. And uh, let me also salute all the great work 
being done by the Rethinking Malaria in Africa Initiative and the presentation just made, which I see as important contribution to revive and boost our commitment to malaria elimination in Africa. Governments have the primary and highest responsibility of promoting the well being of their citizens. That's why they are elected in the first place. In order to achieve this, governments identify and quantify the main problems affecting, the, affecting their citizens in their countries and adopt suitable strategies and interventions to address them. In most African countries, malaria is one of those challenges seriously affecting the well being of the citizens. Current knowledge and experience from many countries, and we the example of uh, Sri Lanka and China, show that malaria can be eliminated when there is the political will translated in practical terms through making that goal an integral part of the overall development program and budgeted plans of action of the country. To be successful, the design and implementation of such policies, programs and plans needed to include the relevant public and private sectors, such as health, public works and housing, agriculture, environment, education, finance, as well as political parties, faith-based organizations, civil society, and private companies, the media, among others. Although the health sector has a leading and coordinating role to play, it is not and should not be the sole responsible for malaria elimination, as many key aspects fall outside its technical capabilities and responsibility. The multisectoral and multidisciplinary approach I mentioned here is meant to, to ensure that all dimensions of the problems of the problem are adequately addressed and supported. The design and implementation of the programs should be based in sound data made available timely, not only to decision makers, but also to the general public as to develop their continuous education and commitment to actively participate in the national goal of malaria elimination. An important role should be played by the national biomedical research institutions which should be tasked with the responsibility to generate evidence to support the policies and the interventions and evaluate their impact, as well as the continuous development of new tools against the vectors and parasites, including vaccines. To enable them to play their expected roles, national research institutions should be seen as important instrument countries have to significantly contribute to the upliftment of the living standards of the population of their countries and regions and beyond. Therefore, the development of human technological resources and their domestic financing should deserve higher attention from governments. However, national efforts need to be complemented by external partnerships, which should be committed to assist in developing further the capabilities of the African research institutions. All in all, governments need to promote and lead the building and maintenance of coalitions and partnerships among relevant national and international actors, united by the same belief and resolve to eliminate malaria in every region of the African continent. This is achievable, as the experience of many countries show, but it demands a systematic approach and a long-term commitment. I thank you very much. Thank you, Leonardo, for those comments. Next, um, we turn to um, Dr. Tatinji um, Gatahi, who is the um, uh, group CEO of AMREP Health Africa. And, and both he and Dr. Samal were members of our the advisory committee for rethinking malaria. Dr. Katahi. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diane. And uh, of course, very delighted to have listened to Professor Musev uh, to uh, His Excellency Museveni, now Professor of Malaria Control, in my view. And uh, I'm sure my sister, uh, Andrea Kazibo, will transfer uh, those thanks. Thank you, Evelyn Ansa, for the presentation. I just want to take a very few minutes to say, number one, is that we've learned that efficacy is not equal to effectiveness. So as we develop tools, wherever we are developing them, and you've seen this with the COVID vaccine, that you can develop it, great R&D, but then if the systems are not there to deliver it to the people, and if the people don't create the pool for them, then the effectiveness can be zero, where the efficacy can be 98%. And this is what we need to think about as we develop tools that when develop tools for, mal for, for malaria, we must think about this value chain that we are looking for effectiveness, which is a longer chain than just efficacy. And we have seen that with mosquito nets, uh, with, with adherence to ACT. Uh, you know, I, it was, um, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Regional Director Moet who was saying, what results in a health worker testing a child positive, but doesn't offer them the required medication? This is the value chain for effectiveness rather than just efficacy. The next thing is that we have seen that where some of these tools succeed, where they're driven by particular initiatives, they succeed as long as the push strategy is working. As long as the push strategy stops because the donor program ends or the project ends, then it doesn't continue. I want to present that based on our presentation and the presentation done for Working Group 2 to integrate into the health service delivery, Sustainability will only come when actually we create adequate pool rather than push. And I think that's an important principle to look at. And that can only happen if we actually look holistically at uh, integration in primary healthcare. And primary healthcare is a foundational uh, principle for universal health coverage. And I'll just reflect on three areas of, of this foundational primary healthcare. One, that looking at the recommendations of working group two, we need uh, to look at integrated primary care. That integrated primary care needs to be fully integrated. And there is an opportunity for us in Africa to actually look at an approach to strategic health programs. We talk a lot about HIV and success of HIV. Those have a lot to do with community level engagement. We talk about TB success and President Museveni talked about this. A lot of that has to do with community level successes. Why is it that malaria cannot also be about community level successes combined with these strategic programs? And that is something that a country can take and say, we are going to have an integration of, to begin with, strategic health programs that have a common community level ownership approach and push those as a success factor for ending uh, malaria. And within this integrated primary care, we need, of course, to utilize the existing tools through looking at that effectiveness model all the way from uh, R&D, uh, you know, tool discovery, delivery through health systems, but also community demand. That must be the way we look at this to achieve integration. And uh, the next thing I want to say on this is that uh, we need them to look at uh, uh, community engagement and community empowerment. And most importantly, uh, for women, this is also the second pillar of primary health care. And when we look at this, we must say that there's no money at the bottom. There is no integration and there is no devolution without devolving power and accountability. And I think most cases, we tend to say devolve to community, but let community raise its own resources. Let the community find its own money to do this work. Ladies and gentlemen, it will not work. I've worked in the health industry a lot. I was a doctor, I've worked at the grassroots level. And I have seen that unless money is devolved to the lowest level, whether it's level one of the health system or level two, and devolved, including accountability. We, have, we set up community committees. We set up facility committees. They must have resources to be able to do what we call early identification, early response, and control. If they have to refer to the center, it cannot work. And we've had that over and over again from uh, Dr. Andira, from the president, from, Chi uh, from China, from Sri Lanka, that community engagement and empowerment, the point I want to add is that there is no money at the bottom. We have to find a way of getting money to the bottom. 
And the other leg of primary health care that must be integrated into this service delivery is, of course, multi-sectoral approach or multi uh, the multi-sector uh, action. And that has to do, of course, bringing private sector for discovery and uh, also innovation and all those things. So as I conclude, I want to say that this is not new at a global level. We have already started, uh, Diane, with a coalition of partnership for UHG and global health. In the meeting which I chaired a few uh, weeks ago, we had rolled back malaria, we had partnership for maternal and child health, with the community mm -hmm. for ending TB, we have the UHG community. We need to latch onto these movements for us to integrate. I think this is really what I want to leave here. But I want to say that in my own observation, it is more likely that a country that has no donor funding will achieve elimination of malaria than, than one that has donor funding. That is a critical thing for us to reflect on, that countries that have no donor funding are more likely to achieve elimination than those that have donor funding. Because donor funding, if left alone and not integrated into the country's financial strategy, is more likely to drive vertical programming than to drive integration. I thank you. Great. Well, thank you for those inspiring comments, uh, Giti. And uh, last uh, but not least, we're going to turn to um, Halima Mwenzi. Uh, and uh, she is the co-author of one of the, the second paper from Working Group 2. We welcome her uh, for her comments. Halima. Um, thank you very much, Diane, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Um, all previous speakers this afternoon and morning, wherever we are sitting, have delineated the challenges and potential practical solutions for malaria control and elimination in Africa. My takeaway from the presentations um, is that there is a collective belief amongst all of us, led by His Excellency the President this afternoon, that the time to defeat malaria is now but the approach cannot be business as usual. This is a message that has come from everyone who has spoken before me. And having worked in this malaria space since 1985, I am optimistic more than ever before that this round of rethinking and retooling of our malaria response will accelerate the momentum towards achieving our malaria targets moving forward. And speaking specifically to the issue of size, skill sets and competencies of the current and future health and malaria workforce, I believe we have the requisite mindset and tools to get it right this time round. And the question is, why this time round? Why now? Why do I have that conviction? And why do we all have that conviction? Firstly, African governments working with WHO and through the African Union and the Africa CDC are committed to ending malaria in Africa. We have seen through all the initiatives and from all the initiatives that we, you know, like the high burden, high impact countries. These are initiatives that have come around because the, the countries and the um, commun world community is committed to ending malaria in Africa. And His Excellency President Museveni this afternoon has affirmed this commitment again for himself and for all our presidents in Africa. Secondly, African countries at the moment have a critical mass of scientists and institutions of excellence that can train, skill, and or reskill and strengthen the health workforce capacities at all levels, from tertiary to community levels. We also have a large reservoir of youth and young adults, male and female, that should be tapped and empowered through training and supervision to assist in the health sector. And as we have heard, we need to do this in an integrated way, multi-sectorially, so that we are bringing in this youth, not only for health, but all the areas that we are, looking, we are looking at. We also at the moment have a very confident, very woke, as the word says, citizenry that has experienced the benefits of working collaboratively, co collaboratively with their governments to manage a pandemic such as COVID-19 decisively. We heard it can either be preaching with a little force or force to actually make things smooth. And that could be mobilized afresh for malaria. We also are lucky at this time to have an educa education sectors, educators and learners in Africa who have become tech savvy and are accustomed to e-instruction 
and also e-learning through different online platforms. We have an opportunity right here to make sure that we actually improve not only the size or quality, but the quantity of, of, of our workforce. And then thirdly, we have a global community that is willing to make a mental switch to shift the center of gravity for malaria response to Africa, stepping back from leadership, but not stepping away, working jointly and more collaboratively with all relevant stakeholders in the training and capacity sectors, and of course, all other sectors of malaria control and elimination. But what will it take to move this new agenda forward? We can talk until the cows come home, as we say in Africa. What I think it will take, and I think we have heard from the previous speakers also, it will take domestic and external resources, money, somebody has to pay for this. It is our own countries, it is our, our partners, our supporters, all the stakeholders, and we need deliberate action on the numerous global and regional commitments that we have. We have pronouncements, we have frameworks, we have memoranda, we have strategies, all related to the very key areas that we have been discussing this afternoon and this morning. We are talking about human resources for health. We're talking about primary health care. We're talking about universal health coverage. We're talking about community engagement, community, community, community. We can keep talking about these things, but this must be implemented. We must do something about it. Otherwise they will remain aspirational and rhetorical. Without an accountability mechanism also to ensure that all stakeholders involved in malaria control and elimination efforts play their part, the desired change will continue to be a mirage. 2030 must not be another missed opportunity. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Halima, again, for those in inspiring comments. And to all of our discussants, thank you for not only these comments, but for your contributions uh, and reflections on the Rethinking Malaria working groups. With this, I'm going to close this session and move to our final session. I recognize we've run over time a little, but uh, we had lots to discuss. We're going to, so we're going to extend uh, the webinar an additional um, 10, approximately 10 minutes. And I'm next going to call on uh, Dr. Benito Impuma, who is the Director of Universal Health Coverage and Communicable and Non-Communicable Diseases at the World Health Organization, AFRO. Uh, Dr. Impuma. Thank you very much. Uh, distinguished guests, partners, and colleagues, on behalf of the regional director, Dr. Moeti, I would like to thank everyone for the active engagement, rich discussions, and your commitment to turning the tide on the malaria burden in Africa. The context of the COVID-19 pandemic, along with the stark progress in global response to malaria, calls us to rethink our approaches to malaria giving us an opportunity to use the innovations developed in response to COVID-19 creatively. In this regard, I would like particularly to thank President Yoweri Museveni of Uganda for really taking time out of his busy schedule to engage with this agenda. His Excellency, in conversation with Dr. Wandira, Expanded, the, expanded on the importance of commitment and leadership at the highest level required to tackle this challenge. Key to which is a multidisciplinary approach that encompasses both the medical and social aspects of response. This was also mirrored by the experiences shared by Professor Kamini and George Gao from Sri Lanka and China, respectively, who emphasize the need for strong leadership informed by science, the critical role of the empowerment of communities and commitments at all levels, from central government to community, along with strong organization. Malaria is a societal problem rather than a medical issue. 
This needs to be tackled through leadership and investment in the health workforce and investment in data-driven innovation and problem solving, while supporting anemic countries in entrepreneurship, research and development, and manufacturing. Malaria elimination should become part of attaining universal health coverage, delivered through primary health care, integrated into the high burden, high impact approach, and monitored through measurable strategic actions. Disease control activities will be led by a team of multidisciplinary experts on the frontier of precision public health using analytics to drive and initiate tailored interventions and tools. WHO Afro urges you to join the emerging new partnership for malaria in Africa, implementing a comprehensive all of society and all of government approach to a malaria-free Africa. I thank all of you for the time taken from your busy schedules to join us in working towards a malaria threat in Africa. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Over to you, Chair. Thank you very much, Dr. Apuma, for those uh, comments, those inspiring comments. And I think for your commitment and the commitment of WHO, AFRO, uh, to make this uh, and a key agenda item. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us today in this far-reaching discussion on rethinking malaria in the context of COVID-19. This is just the beginning of the discussion, and I think as many people have emphasized, it is also the beginning of an implementation of a new way of thinking and an accountability. I have come away from this inspired that eliminating malaria is indeed possible, respectful of the challenges, but the time indeed is now. And I think that this rethinking effort, this, this focusing on us questioning how we're doing things, how we can move away from business as usual, maintaining the gains that we've made, but uh, focusing on how we must do better. And I think you heard the summary from many of the speakers of the key points of commitment of leadership. And we saw that from His Excellency President Museveni and, um, and from many of the speakers, including Dr. Moiti, Dr. Alonzo, the working group chairs, and many of our invited guests for their valuable contributions. I'd also like to express our thanks for our co-sponsors, in particular those that have helped spread uh, the reach of this webinar with simultaneous translation, uh, the Harvard University Center for African Studies and the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. Uh, we also, uh, for the coordination of aspects of the Rethinking Malaria Global Engagement, I'd like to thank the Harvard uh, Defeating Malaria Initiative and the Takimi Program in International Health. As Professor Lakey noted in her opening remarks, this discussion must continue. Later in this month, we will host this two-day webinar on uh, September 28th and 29th with more in-depth discussions by the co-chairs and authors of the Rethinking Malaria papers and with discussions uh, from around the world more information on that will be um, uh, available in the coming weeks uh, on the website. Um, uh, I thank um, uh, all of you for your comments. I look forward, uh, I, I thank particularly um, my co-conspirator, Rose Lakey, um, in uh, really leading the, the thought effort and the focus on why we need to rethink malaria now and the many colleagues that have been involved in this effort. And with that, um, I wish all of you uh, the best of the rest of the day and look forward uh, to the, the actual implementation of many of these ideas. So thank you uh, very much. And with that, we will end the webinar.